Bruce, you must have something really good too. Of course I do. It's Bruce Danielson, and I guess I'm here to entertain you too. All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Tuesday, July 7, Sioux Falls City Council meeting. Uh, we have at least one councillor join us remotely. I may have just heard a second one jump on. And so we'll get started this morning, or this morning, I wish, this afternoon by reading our roll. Council Member Selberg? Here. Sale? Here. Star? Here. Staley? Here. Brecky? Here. Erickson? Here. Kelly? Here. Neitzert? Here. All right, so we have all eight councillors with us tonight, and uh, we have uh, Dr. Ron Tottingham with them. Empire Baptist Temple back with us to give our invocation tonight. So, uh, Dr. Tony M., thanks for being here again. I'd ask that you all rise for his invocation and stay standing for our Pledge of Allegiance, please. So I want to take just a moment of privilege tonight. I want to tell you, I, besides being a Baptist preacher, I'm also a behavioral health doctor, and I'm very aware of this. I've done a lot of history study and so forth of all the plagues, and I want to compliment the city commission for handling something that was a lot of reactive with a lot of moan in it, and between all of you folks here, you did a great you did a great job to me. I don't care what anybody else thinks. In my opinion, you did a great job in all the acting that you had to do to stay on top and to help this still be the best city in the world. And I've been in a lot of them. Thank you from me to you, all of you. Our Heavenly Father tonight, bless this city council as only you can. You've guarded them and guided them in ways that they weren't even aware of. You can do it again, and I ask you to continue to do it. Bless them tonight. Bless their families, their homes, everything about them, that they might be able to continue to help this be the greatest city in the world. And I want to pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Marshall Selberg, and as chair of the city council, it is my honor to recognize Councillor Teresa Staley tonight for her years of service on our city council. Teresa Staley was elected as the at-large city council member in 2016. During her tenure, she served on the Multicultural Center Intergovernmental Board, the Audit Committee, the Southeastern Council of Governments Executive Board. Councillor Staley, on behalf of the City Council, it's my honor to present you with this flag that has been flown over Carnegie Hall with the inscription that reads, in recognition of Teresa Staley for her four years of dedicated public service and commitment to Sioux Falls and its citizens. So won't you please join me in thanking Councillor Staley for her four years of service to the City of Sioux Falls. And as I said, I'm sure we're going to have to twist your arm to say a couple words. As it goes, I will sit down and say a few words. Thank you. Okay. Did we want a picture or anything, or did you get what you needed? Okay, we're done. Thanks. Uh, first of all, um, I want to thank the people of Sioux Falls, um, and I want them to understand that this last four years of my life, four years in about three months, I have given my heart and soul to serve the people out of a heart of love. Every decision that has come before us, I have scrutinized over, 
listened to all sides and, and spent my whole energy trying to help people and to try to protect your best interests. Sometimes that meant asking tough questions. Sometimes it meant questioning our city staff. But I believe that that is what our city wants from their elected officials. They, we are the last stop when it comes to passing any kind of financial uh, policy contractual effort. I have um, stated this many times, and this body knows it, knows it, they've heard it well. My belief is that it's the citizens' money and it's the citizens' business. Everything we do in this body belongs to the people. We are not a private corporation. We belong to you. So we need to make an extra effort at keeping things open and transparent. I am so grateful for the times in the last two years when our mayor has been willing to listen to my ideas and to listen to both sides. And there have been times when he's implemented my ideas. There have been times that my colleagues have been will willing to listen to, to all sides of an issue. Many times I have found that our citizens are not listened to, but this, the council as a body tends to listen to the department heads and the developers. So my energy has been to break out of that and to, to bring the public in as much as I possibly can. I'm very grateful we just came out of a, a historical election. 29,000 people voted in my city council race. 29,000 people. I got almost half. I lost by 97 votes. Thank you to those 14,000 people plus people who, who supported me. And it, it was a race. That's how we, how we do things in our community. I ran a grassroots campaign, a positive campaign, a low budget campaign. My opponent raised a record breaking $117,000 to get into the office. Also, I, I have to say, towards the end of the campaign, it was going very positively. And I have to say this for, for the record, for the public. I am a Republican. I have been a precinct woman in the Republican Party. I've attended conventions. And the state party, some members of, of the state party put out a smear campaign piece against me towards the end, mailed it to many Republicans. I have yet to find out who was behind it. Everybody's pushing the buck. Negative, negative and misinformation in it. So just for the record, I want people to understand that I've been a good Republican, but I have worked in this office to represent all the people. Whether you're a Democrat, independent, Republican, I don't care. We are called to be nonpartisan. And it's disappointing to me that we allowed the Republican Party to come in and put their handprint all over this election. That, that really is not doing the citizens the best service, in my opinion. Um, I have a, a little snapshot of the four years, actually it's 14 years, I'd like to show you very quickly here. And part of my essence for the last 14 years has been responsive representation. I got started in this in 2006 with the Drake Springs pool. When there was going to be an effort to make that an indoor pool, we did a petition drive and we got um, about 76% of the vote that said, we want to maintain an outdoor pool presence in that neighborhood. And it has turned out to be the most uh, widely used pool in our city. Uh, down in the left-hand side, there's a group of women who helped me. I, I worked, we worked together. These women and myself, we raised money to put flowers down along Cliff Avenue because the city wasn't going to do any kind of landscaping. Activism, get out there, put your money out there, put your effort out there, you can make a difference. And then in 2012, we did a petition drive for snow gates. I had heard about these from our, our uh, previous council member who passed away last year, Kermit Stagers. Kermit talked about snow gates for years. And everybody just threw them to the curb. They thought that was the stupidest idea they'd ever heard of. And I heard it, and I started calling Bismarck where they were used. And then our mayor, Mike Huther, thought they would be a good thing to try. 
And one thing led to another, and we did a petition drive. I led the drive. Bruce Daniels and Harold Gilsrud were the, my co-chairs, along with 40 other people. In 2012, we, ga we gathered 8,400 signatures. We put that to a vote, and it won by a landslide. And now our city enjoys snow gates. I will tell you, as a council member, these last four years, I have fielded uh, many, many phone calls from people concerned about the service. And that's one of the things I did, and I will continue to do, is I would call Mark Cotter, I called the mayor, I said, we need to go back and, and take a look at what happened with their street. And people want, they, they deserve to be uh, serviced because it is an ordinance. So we're gonna continue to make that a priority. Then in 2015, I got involved with Greg Jamison as he was working on uh, updating our Boulevard Gardening Ordinance. And now you see we have, I think we're gonna be getting this parking strip thing updated. We couldn't actually find it, Mayor Paul. Um, there's nothing on the website that will help people see that. This was one of my old um, flyers. But we got this ordinance passed that allows you to do creative gardening on your boulevard. And uh, there is an energy happening within our community that is really geared towards environmentally friendly policies. And we, we passed a boulevard or a, a beekeeping ordinance. Um, we're talking about rain gardens. We're talking about uh, plantings that are native to our area. It's so exciting. And I can see, I think that's where our city is going to be uh, traveling in, as we move on. City Council outreach, I have been committed to finding ways of getting together with the people and listening to them. Every year I make a, a weekend at the Benson Flea Market talk to people, and it's so exciting. And let me say, I have invited my colleagues to come with me. Most of these things I've done, I've invited my colleagues to come with. Janet Brecky came with me, Pat Starr stopped by, and I, you see I have all of our information here. I pass that little sheet out wherever I can go. Call your council members, connect to us, we're here for you. City Council outreach, we went to the Native American parade. Uh, I went to the Native American healthcare grand opening. I went to, I spent a, a Saturday last summer at the Festival of Cultures, telling people about the free bus pass program that we had, and also wanting to hear from the community so I could hear the, the perspective of all members of our town. Faith Temple food giveaway, very important. Uh, partner in helping our, the people who don't have enough to eat. Councilor Starr and I helped with the Barrel House Dunk Tag Benefit Hungry Heart School Lunch Program last summer. It was, uh, the mayor has done that in the past and I'll tell you, we got bruised badly, but it was, it was worth it. Uh, I helped with the tornado cleanup with Councilor Brecky there. I helped with, clean up the railroad um, over by uh, the McKinnon Park area. We went to spend a Saturday with that with Diane DeCoyer. We uh, helped with sandbag outreach. Again, this council thing is not just a five hour a week thing. For me, it was my life, helping people always. I went to the White Wall sessions. Unfortunately, we heard that that's, they're gonna be halting their um, performances. Dal Rummel, did a piano uh, dedication. They're a wonderful facility for recitals. We used to have small business Saturdays. There's Joe Batchelor and our old, own Jeff, uh, uh, what's Jeff's last name? Eckhoff, good old Jeff. And so, yeah, we used to do small business Saturdays. I, that might be something you want to pick up again. Uh, did a safe house tour, missing an action ceremony down by the river last year. Independence Day pic picnic, I helped with the 4th of July picnic the last two years. We fed 5,000 people, fabulous. Uh, hy V uh, co City Council Outreach Counselor Greg Neisert joined me the first year I did that. Um, but it, people really appreciated ways of, of getting out and meeting with people. And it's nice if it's not related to an issue. We're just, they're listening to, to your concerns. Site visits, big deal. And we got people, I th believe here, that are gonna be talking about a car wash situation. I did countless site visits. When we actually go to the property and see what, and eyeball it, it makes a, helps us to make better decisions. Jerry's Barbershop called. All, all of a sudden there was a no parking thing. See, it says two hour parking on the right. And all of a sudden somebody painted a yellow strip there, no parking. Jerry calls me, Teresa, what's going on here? 
found out somebody just went out and started painting yellow stripes there. Uh, we had a thing over on a Main Avenue with the Cascades here. I brought Lloyd Company and the business owners together to talk about, and the city, how we could find compromise for people. That's what people want. And then in the last two and a half months, the biggest, most intense situation in our pastor reference this was when our mayor said on a Monday on his press conference, we're going to have a stay at home ordinance. I'm passing it tomorrow, which would have been on a Tuesday. And mayor, you told people to call and email the council. I had hundreds of emails that night on a Monday night. I hadn't seen the, the ordinance yet. Angry emails. These are constituents who are voting for me. I was right in the middle of a, the absentee voting period. People threatening. Staley, we got the ballot on the table. How are you going to vote for this thing? On either side, people wanted us to do a stay at home. People didn't want us to do a stay at home. And so luck and then we had that we, we did when we got presented with it we had this essential worker chart which i got a photo of but i mean this, i've never experienced anything so intense as that issue unfortunately i have a feeling that we could be revisiting that in the future and it's it's just such a very difficult thing to 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 negotiate to navigate um so that that was probably the most intense thing and, and that was after the election should have happened. So this was really an endurance builder. City Council outreach here again, site visits. Uh, Councilor Kylie joined me in this one, but we have people all the time that are having concerns about these rezoning issues. And again, we're having this discussion about what kind of three-story apartment building can go where. Do you want it in your backyard? Are there, are there places that are more appropriate than others? We're gonna have to have these discussions as we move forward so that we protect neighborhoods. And I've always tried to listen to the neighbors as much as I listen to the developers. And let me be frank, I know that developers did not support my reelection and because I stood for the people and that is okay with me because I stood for what was right. If it means losing, so be it. Protecting our neighborhoods. Last summer, handyman tells me they got a problem at the Whittier area. I organized the business owners, the city staff came on board. We had several meetings to listen to everyone, the nonprofits and the businesses and homeowners to say, what can we do to make this better? Again, you hear there's a problem and then you respond to it. Hear it, the responsive representation. That's what people want. And I will be frank, Mr. Mayor, that guy at Brian on the end said to me, what, what prompted me, he said, I wish the mayor would come down here sometime and look at what we were going through. And I thought, okay, I'll go down. And I did. Neighborhood Summit, Mayor Huther, he incorporated this years ago. We had let, it was dormant. I approached the mayor with Councilor Breck. He said, can we bring it back? He said, yes. So we, this was held last fall, the neighbors, uh, the associations, the neighborhood watch people love it. And so I appreciate the, the mayor allowing us to do that. And I hope that we can continue to move forward with that. Citizen safety, uh, we had our neighborhood watch picnics. I went to 10 of them last year, uh, reached out, spent a lot of time driving around to drop in because this is such a fabulous program. I've been promoting neighborhood watch since I started one uh, about 15 years ago. Here it is right here. I've been passing that flyer around since I've been elected. Neighborhood watch. Eyes and ears for the police department. Last year, here you go, Mr. Sneedy, there you are. We had the uh, town hall at uh, Kenny Anderson. It was about a year ago. We'd had shootings there, came together. Proactive, fabulous. We need to do more of those. Touching base with all the neighborhoods. Just had a random shooting, a murder last week. We've got to do things to clean up these neighborhoods. And it starts with organically with the people who live there. I did a police ride along. I know several of my colleagues have done that as well. I've supported the police. I have supported their contractual um, fairness. Sometimes all they want is a non-monetary concession. I say, you know, go for it. They, they, let's build them up so that they can protect us as effectively as possible. Annexation outreach. 
when we first got elected started talking about grabbing some of these homeowners property outside the city limits and when the city refused to notify these sixteen hundred property owners i said ok i'll do it i made that that flyer myself i paid for it i was spent a weekend going to all the different annexation areas and handing it out to people as they drove into the into that pocket of homes and said please help pass this word around they were expecting twenty five people at this meeting over a hundred showed up and it ended up these people kept coming it ended up being a uh, procedure that would be, be beneficial to everyone involved because the citizens got involved they can't get involved if they don't know what's coming they can't get involved we did the beekeeping ordinance i did a little thing on south dakota Bro broadcasting talking about promoting beekeeping public input uh, after our mayor got elected councillor selberg came up with an idea to take public input and put it to the back of the meeting uh, we had a very behind the scenes very fiery discussion and i i fought to keep that at the beginning of the meeting and we compromised to take it from that five minutes it used to be we reduced it to three minutes and then we added some public input on the first reading which was really cool but in the midst of that i used my own money and i had this postcard made up and i mailed it out to people because otherwise they won't know what's going on so part of my city council salary has gone a big chunk of it to mailing things out to you so you understand what's happening in our community and i hope that public input will never be touched again promoting transparency the event center campus meetings were being uh, done secretly Councilor Starr and I had a resolution saying let's open these up and then the mayor and his staff said well we'll open them up and they did here's a picture of that Councilor Starr and I wanted to see the safety study audit couldn't see it all of a sudden then it appeared and it turned out it never was really written down it was all word of mouth a city council action multi-use parking ramp when that thing emerged that parking ramp I said oh th there's too many problems here what again we're called to vet this out to ask the hard questions and I sent that notice out see it's yellow I mailed that to people I said call your council members I was hoping the public would be able to get us to slow it down they showed up I'll tell you full force but we, we it was voted through anyway I did not vote for it but my colleagues did and now we're facing challenges again I think we need to slow things down and vet things out for everyone some things that I sponsored some people will say hey Staley's a negative Nelly all she talks about is you know concerns well I also tried to get some positives done the table tennis that you'll see over at Riverdale Park I worked with our finance department and city staff and we put that in the budget solar speed signs brought that up Mark Cotter purchased those you'll see more of those around town um, project trim I'm a big advocate that we need to make project trim part of the city budget and not put that on the back of homeowners uh, we got the, and I hope we still have it in the budget but we have a, a fund now to help people who are struggling which is a step I also work to, to get keep Frank Olson in the the capital plan so that we aren't going to make it into a spray park that was good we tried to get project SOS uh, so that we could help backpacks by using parking funds but because of our a parking ramp situation that was too uh, tight to go there uh, had an ordinance for park board redistricting that we wanted everyone uh, in our city to have a park board member from their district and I, I have to give our mayor credit because he I think has been doing that on his own but I think that should be written as an ordinance that every di every district every part of town has somebody from the park board on their um, from on the park board from their district and then I also asked that the, the city put up pool signage and that of course Frank Olson was the picture I took because there's a tree in front of it but you'll notice now there are there are signs to pools and that is just I think very helpful so before in closing thank you I've got more than my five minutes of public input I, I want to say that two things and I've said this to the mayor many times and it's been a point of contention between the mayor and myself but I'm going to tell you because what the heck what have I got to lose 
Um, and I said it to him right when he got elected, and I said it to him last week. I said, Paul, you're not my boss. I said, God's my boss, and the people of Sioux Falls are my boss. He's not the CEO of us. He, it, we are equals. He's got his branch of the government. We have ours. And I, my philosophy has been all the, all the while, we are called to be independent. We certainly collaborate on things, but it's not at the expense of involving the public and using our best judgment. That's the kind of government I want for my city council. And I think at least 14,000 people agreed with me on that. We're not a private corporation. We're doing the public's business. And the last thing I'm going to end with is a, a piece of scripture that I have used many years myself. And I think it's so appropriate for us when we're dealing with other people's money, making decisions about other people's business, uh, to, to embrace this. From Mark chapter 8, verse 36, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his very soul? Thank you, Sioux Falls. God bless you. All right. Thank you, Councillor Steely. On behalf of the city, we thank you for uh, your four years of service on the council here. All right. With that, we're going to move on to uh, item five, which is our consent agenda approval. Look for a motion on that or changes. Move to approve. Second. All right. Motion approved by Kylie, seconded by Selberg. Any dis discussion on that, Council? All right, we'll vote on that, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Brecky? Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. All right, that passes 7 to 0. Next item, please. Item 48, approval of the regular agenda. All right, look for any... Uh, well, first, let's take a motion on that. Move to approve. Second. All right. Motion approved by Kylie, seconded by Selberg. Any discussion on our regular agenda, Council? All right. Let's uh, take a vote on that, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Brecky? Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. All right, that passes seven to zero. We are at the uh, general input, general, excuse me, general public input portion of our agenda tonight. As a reminder, input during this portion will last no more than three minutes per person, and in total lasts no more than 30 minutes. During general public input, the public is welcome to speak on any topic that does not appear later on the agenda. For regular agenda items following general public input, comments are limited to three minutes unless the item is being presented for final adoption, on which case public input is limited to five minutes. For all regular agenda items, comments are limited to the agenda item under consideration only. So just a reminder, I know there's a lot of people here to speak on items tonight. If it's on the agenda, we'll get to that when we get to that agenda item. This time is for anything not on the agenda. So at this time, I'd like to invite anyone forward for general public input. And clerk, please note our time is 7.28. Yeah. Good evening. Hello, my name is Steve Johnson. Your secretary knows me real good, because every time I call her, the cops come and visit me. I want to know what you people are going to do about Heritage Park, all the homeless people. I've been here 25 years, and I'm tired of it. It goes from one committee to another, because it doesn't affect you, and it is not in your neighborhood. So heck with us, right? See, we had a meeting last summer, we talked about it, had all winter to figure it out, nothing happened. What are you going to do about it? Do you have any other comments, Steve? What? Do you have any other comments? I think this is a joke. All right, thank you. Anyone else this evening for general public input? Bridge Sioux Falls. I want everybody to know how serious I am. I'm going to come on board with the Pettigrew Neighborhood Association, and we need to clean up the neighborhood. The mayor needs to put his foot down on the chief of police. I was in there for the fireworks situation. I don't want no smack with the police. 
When we want to do citizens' arrests and there's evidence, we need to start making those citizens' arrests and clean up this neighborhood. I will be out there next week. We're either going to clean it up for the neighbor or the um, landlords can sell their properties because we don't want it in Pettigrew neighborhood. I would do everything I can to back up these landlords in the corner to either fix up their rentals or get the hell out of Pettigrew neighborhood. What we had on First and, uh, and Prairie, uh, the victims that got shot, I was just there two years ago when they were trying to take over the neighborhood and put some shoelaces uh, and, sh uh, and shoes on the power line. I told the police officers two years ago that the gang members were gonna take over that neighborhood. And what happened to that? The victims that own it out of Flandreau has boarded up windows. We need to reduce the crime in that neighborhood, in Pettigrew neighborhood, by getting code, fire violations, and enforcement. Kurt Stale, I don't know if you're for the rich people or not, but Pettigrew Neighborhood Association has reached out to you. When I come on board with this, you need to come on board because I'm going to run up against you with other people for your council seat coming up. We have issues on crime in Central District. You did not run on wealth. Central District is a poor neighborhood. We don't have too many wealthy people in the neighborhood. You need to get out there and start with the police department and get the police department on board for this. I am tired of doing citizen's arrest. I am tired of my phones ringing up and they're sitting there calling you and nobody's coming. Michelle Erkenbach went and sat up on the porch and just said, oh yeah, there's crime, there's drug dealing, didn't do nothing. We need proactiveness. I'm telling you, I'm running up against you with two other people. We need someone to relate in Pettigrew neighborhood, not just for the rich. Esta um, establishing um, sustainable, uh, uh, sustainable connections here. Um, we gotta watch what we're doing with the city with these African Americans, it's a joke. They're the ones that uh, did the protest and then the riot followed after. Teenager um, took a police officer by the arm and drug the police officer, if y'all remember that correctly. So when people's gonna come here with the African American community, they need to put the African American community in check here with all the crime with the African American community because it's sickening. Um, I'm asking Denise Tucker to refrain from um, establishing um, sustainable connections also because she is part of that organization. All right, thank you. Please come forward, thank you. Start the timer. Greetings, I'm David Zokaitis, and I'm here to talk about race riots in America. It seems like no matter what color you are, whether you're white or you're black or, or you wear a blue suit, you have a problem with uh, riots in America. And it starts long ago, because we've got this massive history of racism and genocide and slavery, and there are some hidden agendas behind racism usually, and we don't like those either. If you want to go to the worst race riot in America, it happened uh, about 100 years ago when a large portion of Oklahoma got basically destroyed. It's really amazing how bad it really was. And there's a picture. It used to be a thriving black community, and it was destroyed with racial violence. Nasty, nasty, nasty. Okay. There have been quite a few series of incidents of uh, protests and race, racial riots. There's a list from Wikipedia, and some of those are, are not complete lists. They, there are a lot of protests within those lists. So, a lot of stuff going on. And some of the underlying issues are drug prohibition that promoted racism, felony voter disenfranchisement that made second-class citizens, a lot of problems. All right, and sometimes police, they go off the deep end, and they cause a riot too, and it happens. And check it out on Wikipedia if you like. Now, in Sioux Falls, if you want to uh, encourage more protests, then there's a list of things that you might do, and unfortunately, they were all done, so need some work. The city thinks that everything is fine the way it is. I tend to differ. I think there's better ways of doing things. And indeed, if you want to make a better search, you could start with a little more empathy. Don't involve so much overwhelming force. And uh, don't vandalize the place if you have to search it. Just minimize the damage. Now, we were talking, the speaker before me talked about homelessness at Heritage Park. And if you understand what's really going on, if you can accept people for what they are, if you have an, an approach to heal it, well, then you can solve homelessness and, and 
alcoholism at Heritage Park. I kind of talked about going to a homeless shelter to resolve that problem at a different time. And there's a fifth ancient looking photograph that I took a few weeks ago, it looks kind of cool. I thought you might enjoy it. You gotta have something to smile about with all the, top, with all the problems you talk about. And with that, hey, good evening, everybody. All right, thank you. Anyone else this evening? Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Michaela Smothers. I moved. Uh, we raced to the Whittier neighborhood right across the street from Heritage Park. You recently heard my neighbor Steve speak. He's lived there for 25 years. For, for perspective, in three weeks since I've moved into the Whittier neighborhood, between my neighbor and myself, we've had to call the cops 15 times due to violence, um, alcohol, swearing, people being there past the hours. The park opens at 5 o'clock in the morning. They roll up at 5 a.m., they start getting drunk, violent, belligerent, and I can't even sit on my front porch without hearing vulgarity with my children, which is obscene. I'm renting my property. I'm choosing to spend money there. And these people trash the park every day. And when I spoke with a police officer last night, because I had to call the police to have the park cleared at 1030 at night, because people were hunkering down to sleep in the park rather than going to a homeless shelter because they can't because of the fact that they are intoxicated and the homeless shelters do not allow intoxicated humans into their facilities. This is a bigger issue. When I spoke with the police officer, he told me to come to you guys. He told me to call the various councils, call the health department, call the parks department, call Lutheran Social Services who brought some of them over to Sioux Falls. I should not have to make all of these phone calls for my children to feel safe without me having to carry a weapon to take them to the park across the street from my house. I shouldn't have to worry about a gentleman coming over and accosting me on my property when it's posted no trespassing because I want to sit on my front porch at the end of the day because I've worked very hard. And my fiance is in the Army National Guard. And over the 4th of July, some of those individuals went across the street to Johnstone, stole a flag that the VFW chose to put up to celebrate the 4th of July, and then vandalized the park. The, the gravity of the situation is much larger than you think. My neighbor's been calling. I will continue to come every Tuesday until you guys do something about it. Because the cop told me, just call every 15 minutes if you have to drain our resources, we'll come back because they're sick of it too. The judges are getting sick of the tickets. You guys need to do something to make this a safe neighborhood so my children can walk to school. You need to do something. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Michaela. Bruce Danielson. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to look at my phone here. Uh, I got an email. Uh, the family of Kermit Stagers had planned on being here tonight, and 
and uh, they had a family emergency, and so June asked me to, to read something for Teresa. First, I want to thank the City Council for allowing citizens of Sioux Falls the opportunity to speak before the Council. Secondly, tonight is Teresa Staley's last night as a Sioux Falls City Council person for this term. As a City Council person, Teresa has been a good leader, a person who has listened to the people's needs, put performance before politics, the regular folk before the rich, and that Teresa Staley has served well all of the people of Sioux Falls equally and fairly, and I and the people of Sioux Falls thank her for her service and hope to see her again on the City Council. We've had, through this experience since 2012, I've gotten to know the Staggers family. I came to admire Teresa, Scott Ersman, June, and especially Kermit Staggers, and the public servants that all of these people have been. Uh, I've watched some people on the city council turn their back on the citizens. And it's, it's a shame because what Teresa was going through tonight, what June was referring to, what the life of Kermit Staggers was all about was public service and that all of you people sitting here are our votes to move the city forward. We seem to come to city council and just as several people have talked about here tonight, we get forgotten because you all get so busy in all your little policy games and placing where your desks are going to be or whatever that might be that we kind of forget that we've had since Teresa's been involved, Drake Springs, Citizens for Snowgate, Spellerberg Pool, Save Our Schools, the Walmart fight, Stop the Funding, where the 6,400 people got cheated out of a, out of a vote. Sh the Shape Places fiasco that Greg Neitzert was going to champion the fix for and he never has. The triple check the charter that once again we got cheated out of being able to do it. City is, and citizen outreach is what Kermit taught us and Teresa took it to heart. There have been many elected officials who have claimed to be open and transparent. Teresa, ever the teacher, taught us all what it, this really means to be a teacher. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Come on forward. Good evening. My name is Mike Zitterich from Sioux Falls. Teresa brought something up uh, not a little bit ago. I found this online uh, a few days ago. When we built this country, we, our founding fathers initially didn't want political parties. They knew from past experience from, from within the British government why they didn't want political parties. It, brought, it, it created division, bickering, greed, driven competition among, the, among all the people. What, why do we have to have political parties? Teresa said it right. Whether you're Republican or Democrat, we're all Americans. But maybe, maybe the problem we have here is it's not so much what we want, that's for ourselves, but what we need to start thinking of for the people. Maybe, maybe the real problem is the government is getting too, too far away from the people. What, what would it take to have a discussion about bringing the, the council back closer to the people by getting rid of the at-large at districts and having smaller districts. What, what about a, a, a more a, a neighborhood-sized, family-sized district? Maybe that's the discussion we should be having. Smaller districts, closer to the people, get more involved. Maybe that will create more participation among the voters. As we saw, when people care, they show up. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Anyone else this evening? Tim Stenga. One thing that I have been doing for the last two to three years, uh, me and Pat get together. And we have a ride-along through the neighborhood on Whittier. We look at every house and matter of fact we bring the city with us too we have two or three people from the city come along with us 
we drive down every street, we look at every house, and we write down numbers, names, and Pat has been a great person to work with. He's not afraid to do a drive along with me. He might wear his mask this year, but normally he's down in the seat and doesn't want anybody to see him with me, but he's always been there. For Whittier neighborhood, he has cleaned up a lot of houses in there. The city has done a lot of, a lot of good jobs in that neighborhood. I tell these people that came up on the park, do the same thing. Get the city involved. Bring the city on ride-alongs with you. Set it up with them. Bring them through the neighborhood. See what needs to be cleaned up. Every single city councilor person that is sitting here today and listening on, TV, on, their, on uh, their telephone should be going through their neighborhoods. I have a house on Prairie Avenue that was three houses from the shooting. My question is, for a city councilor that's in that neighborhood, how there can be plywood on windows and nothing was turned in. It's just amazing. So maybe what the city councilors that are representing the citizens of Sioux Falls, what they should do is drive through their neighborhoods. Don't be afraid to write down houses that need to be cleaned up. If they're boarded, have the city there the next day. Get it fixed up. That's the only way we're going to get this city cleaned up. And when it comes down to defunding the police officers, you know, the police, no, absolutely not. We need police officers on the street. We need more police officers on the street. If people want to get, people want to do what they want to do with the police, maybe what we should do is send them to Chicago, New York, New Jersey, California, and maybe they'll really enjoy their life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else this evening? All right, clerk, next item, please. Next item is item 50, condi conditional use permit appeal 11980-2020, 1500 South Minnesota Avenue, vicinity 24th Street, lying adjacent in West 37, South 44, Northeast Quarter, and West 60th, North 88th, Northeast Quarter, and West 40 and a half, Southeast Quarter, and West Half, Block 5, and Northwest Quarter, Block Half, Hayes addition to City of Sioux Falls, the request for the conditional use permit is for the applicant to operate a car wash within 200 feet, 250 feet of any DD or AD residential form. Good evening, Jason. Good evening, Council. Mayor uh, Jason Bieber representing Planning and Development Services. Uh, this is an application by Wade Beam representing the Silver Star Car Wash. Uh, the owners are JBB Ventures, LLC. Uh, it's located at 1500 South Minnesota Avenue on the east side of Minnesota between 23rd Street and 25th Street. Uh, it's about 1.67 acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this uh, conditional use permit is the uh, Silver Star Car Wash is looking at remodeling the existing uh, Vern ID building. Uh, they're looking at doing their corporate office on the north portion of the building. Uh, they're looking at adding a car wash tunnel to run a Silver Star Car Wash in the center per portion. And then the south portion would be used for training uh, for their on-site staff. Uh, they will then move kind of all of their main operations over to this with the office portion of it. Uh, we did hear uh, concerns from the neighbors, specifically the existing neighbors to the east. Uh, two of their main concerns were, were obviously sound and traffic. Uh, the applicant did uh, conduct a sound study. Uh, that sound study uh, did give them a good idea of some elements that they can do for this specific site to actually meet uh, the sound ordinance, which is 60 decibels at the property line. Uh, they provided uh, a new fence around, along that east side, some new landscaping. Uh, they're looking at doing some wing walls coming outside of the car wash tunnel. Uh, the vacuums will be situated adjacent to South Minnesota Avenue. And then these vacuums all run on one, what they call a producer. And that you can see is at the southeast corner of this property adjacent to Minnesota Avenue. Uh, that producer uh, would be surrounded by a CMU wall with then most of the sound being funneled towards Minnesota Avenue. Uh, the other uh, main concern was obviously traffic with that existing neighborhood. I uh, just wanted to reiterate that the applicant isn't proposing any new accesses on 23rd or 25th Street or eliminating any accesses on Minnesota Avenue. Really the only change is they're looking at, uh, they would be 
purchasing both of these properties, the main one in the middle and then that existing office on the south side. And they would be proposing just to eliminate that curb for another access point uh, to 23rd, or excuse me, 25th Street. Uh, they've also shown on this site plan uh, that they're willing to put in some uh, seasonal speed bumps, not permanent ones, but ones that can be removed when winter comes, obviously for plowing reasons. They don't, doesn't lend themselves to have them there all year round, but they would put two of them heading out to 25th Street and then one on the north side heading out to 23rd Street, hopefully to slow down traffic um, going on those two streets. Uh, staff does still feel uh, in our engineering department that the majority of the traffic will most likely go to Minnesota. Uh, people are creatures of habit and they usually look for the easiest way out uh, with the vacuums being situated on Minnesota Avenue. Uh, it is our thought that most of the traffic will go there with the traffic going to 23rd or 25th will most likely be people that are going to the east or living in that existing neighborhood. Uh, we do have a representative from the traffic engineering department here uh, to provide you any more information you would like to know about traffic in this area. And that will conclude the presentation. All right, thank you, Jason. All right, we'll move to public input and ask if there's anyone from the public here to speak on this item. You can come forward. Good evening. Good evening, Council. Aaron Norman. I'm the project engineer for the site, uh, 3800 West 53rd Street. As Jason mentioned, the existing site uh, is owned by Vern ID and is being purchased by Solar Star. It is, runs along Minnesota Avenue. On the north side, you got 23rd Street, and on the south side, you got 25th Street. Um, the property does include uh, an office building on the south that's part of the parcel purchase, and that will remain intact as part of the project. Um, the property is currently zoned C2 and is currently being used by Vernity to stage and store vehicles as they fix them up or re and wash them in detail before they go out and sale. There is an existing car wash on site. It's on the north end of what we're showing as the office building, and there's existing service bay doors along the east side of the building that face the residential neighborhood. Um, right, or as the site plan shows, there are 10 residential homes that border the east side of our project. Um, the proposed plan um, shows that we're converting the existing building in kind of three portions. The training will be up against Minnesota Avenue. The center portion of the building, which is an existing showroom, will be converted into a car wash. And then on the east side of the building, we'll have office. Um, and the overhead service bay doors will remain in place to service some of the fleet vehicles that Silver Star has and allow for some additional storage. Access uh, to Minnesota Avenue will remain in place um, with the proposed plan. We'll utilize this as an entrance to funnel cars along the front side of the building and loop them around to the north end of the building um, and allow for adequate staging. Access will remain onto 23rd Street, which would allow for a bypass lane for vehicles who wish to kick out before they go in the wash, which will also allow for neighborhood traffic to enter the wash without having to go on Minnesota Avenue. Um, Access will remain out to 25th Street and will be connected into our site to allow users to exit the site to the south. Um, as I mentioned, cars will enter the north side of the car wash. Um, we're going to have two overhead doors and likely converge you know, cars inside the building into one single lane. This will allow for double row stacking on the outside to allow cars for adequate room um, and staging. Uh, and then exit on the south end of the site. The vac proposed vacuum bay stalls are located up against Minnesota Avenue on the southwest corner of the site. We felt this was as far away from the residential properties as possible. And I think as noted on there, there's a 47 foot distance there to the closest vacuum bay to that residence. Um, we've also located the vacuum producer, which is kind of like a central vac for a house that runs to all those producers. Um, in the southwest corner of the site, away from the neighborhood as far as possible, and will be enclosed in a CMU wall. Um, another thing, as we exit the tunnel, for those that were able to visit the site, there's some elevation differences out there on site. So as part of the project, we'll be looking to lower the tunnel going through the, or the car wash tunnel in the building uh, to help match into existing grades. So this will require some of those wing walls Jason mentioned to transition back up to where grade is today. 
um, these are some of the recommendations that would help with some of the sound mitigation strategies in that sound study. Um, as part of the project, we're also looking to replace the existing wood paneling fence that runs from 23rd Street all the way to 25th Street. Um, this fence is rather unique. It's got concrete pillars every 15 to 20 feet that kind of serve as end posts for the fencing system. We're planning to leave those in place to incorporate them into our new fencing system. Um, the new fence will be around six feet in tall, but there will be some fences, a portion of the fence may be seven feet to accommodate some of the elevation changes throughout the site. Um, as mentioned, looking to down some sound barriers on the south end of the tunnel at the exit. Um, this is kind of a little unique area. As you see, there's a vacated 24th Street that went through this site. Um, 24th Street was vacated back in 1995 based on the documents I found and converted into a city utility easement. We have reached out to some utilities, our city staff on trying to confine uh, this corridor easement down to allow us to do some of these improvements. Uh, we conducted a, a one call locate ticket to see who was out there for utilities. And there's a public water main that bisects right through the middle of the site. Um, so we'll continue to work with city staff on narrowing down that easement to allow some of these improvements to happen. Um, in addition to that, there's an overhead power line that runs from the north to the south, just on the east side of the existing building and kind of parallels the southern portion of the property line. Uh, we reached out to Excel Energy and Mid-American, or Mid-Continent Communications, and talked to them about a landscaping plan that they allow for permittable trees beneath their power lines. They provided us a landscaping guide to, to refer to as we laid out our planting plan. Also, as you can see, there's a lot of secondary overhead power lines that uh, provide service to the adjoining neighbors. So we kind of were careful about the placement of these trees not to interfere with some of their service lines. Um, as part of the planning commission approval process, there were uh, two neighborhood meetings that were conducted. Um, due to being a planning commission member, I was unable to attend for a conflict of interest and uh, unable to participate in any of those meetings. But um, however, once found out that the neighborhoods appealed their decision, I reached out to one of the neighbors and met with her one evening to just feel what her concerns were and impacts to this, uh, for this site. Um, based on her concerns and feedback, um, kind of coming with about four little different items that uh, kind of came out. Uh, one obviously is the sound. Um, based on the sound study and the ordinance, we feel that we can meet the 60 decibel level. Um, there's several items that were listed in this study. Um, and we understand it's a performance requirement and we can get there. If we don't meet that requirement, we won't be able to operate the facility. One of those is lowering the exit tunnel, try to get those sounds closer to the ground. So we'll be lowering the elevation of that exit tunnel three-ish feet or so with wing walls and a sound wall next to it. We're replacing that existing perimeter fence that's got holes in it today with a new solid vinyl fence. Um, and then we'll obviously we removed the uh, located the producer vacuum producer up against Minnesota Avenue. One of the second items that was concerned is right now the existing facility is staged with a bunch of cars and the current employees park on the side streets. With the proposed plan, there's 43 parking stalls along the east property line, and the Silver Star team anticipates three employees working on a daily shift at the tunnel, 15 employees working in the corporate office and around 20 employees max at a training session. I guess in my math's right, that's about 38 employees with 43 stalls, plus they got the service bay door to store additional vehicles. So they shouldn't be parking on side streets. Um, one of the third items is trip generation. How many cars a day is this site gonna be produced? Um, this is a new site on Minnesota Avenue. So they don't know any data on how much it'll produce, um, but they're anticipating 10 to 12 vehicles an hour. Um, compared to other sites, coffee shops, or convenience stores, this is probably a relatively low number per day based on square footage. They also install, like Jason mentioned, seasonal speed bumps throughout the site that will be removed during the winter for snow removal operations. Um, this is similar to the other sites in town. And then fourth, I guess, access onto the adjacent local streets. 
Um, city traffic engineering is here. We know there's some upcoming proposed improvements on Minnesota Avenue. And uh, we understand that it may look a little different in the future, maybe a median, may get a little wider. They've noted that we'll have to give up additional right away. So we want to preserve our local street connections to help our site function and for connectivity. I guess in conclusion, we felt we've met with the neighbors and city engineering staff to develop a plan that we feel could be successful for everybody. Um, thank you for your time. And I'd like to introduce Andrea Vito. She's kind of the regional manager, manager for Silverstar to speak on behalf of the ownership. Sounds good. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks. Good evening. Hi. Uh, Andrea Vito, 3900 East 10th Street. Um, thank you, everybody, for taking the time to listen and learn about our uh, project here. Um, as he mentioned, I am the regional manager for Silver Star Car Wash for Sioux Falls. Um, I've been with Silver Star since 2015, uh, joined the company before we opened our second location as a site manager, and uh, now am the regional manager for Sioux Falls, responsible for our seven locations here and our 150 team members. Um, this location is really exciting and important for us for a couple of reasons. Um, the location is great for our current Unlimited Pass members. We've had a uh, request for a central location for a really long time, so I think it would be well received. Uh, we also like the ability to build our headquarters here in Sioux Falls, and this location would allow us to bring our corporate support staff and our maintenance team together in one location. Um, additionally, this location would just allow us with our headquarters here to be able to continue to build a strong team of top talent as we continue to grow throughout the Midwest. Um, we are committed to being a good neighbor to those uh, in our neighborhood, and if you've had a chance to visit any of our other locations in town, um, you are probably familiar with the high standards of, of cleanliness and appearance that we hold for our sites. Additionally, we plan to continue to be a good employer to provide good jobs with good pay and great benefits to our team members. Um, and we also hope to continue to give back to the community um, through events, donations. Um, we've supported schools, community groups, uh, different charities throughout our years here. Um, we wanted to give a quick thank you to the city staff for working with our teams during this project. They've been incredibly helpful. Um, and I would just ask for your vote of support for this project to allow Silver Star to build this headquarters here in Sioux Falls and to continue to be a premier Sioux Falls employer. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Andrea. Anyone else here to speak on this item tonight? Please come forward. Come on forward, sir. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Uh, I'm Bruce Eide, and I am a property owner on South Dakota Avenue, 1515 South Dakota Avenue. Uh, listening to the presentation uh, really took me back because it was in 1994 that um, Steve Metley, the city planner, and I were walking. Uh, Bernardi Motor Cars had already owned the block between 23rd and 24th on the uh, location that we have now. We had just bought two or three properties to the south of 24th. And um, Jim Nord was working for the city at the time. And he said, gee, Bruce, let me get this straight. You own on the north side and you own on the south side maybe you ought to apply to the city and vacate 24th Street. And that was a wonderful idea. We didn't know it at the time, but it was a wonderful idea. And um, so we applied. And 24th Street was thusly vacated. Um, for our part, we did our very best in the neighborhood coming off of South Dakota Avenue to integrate uh, 24th Street to create a new driveway for two shared houses, including the one that I own, 1515, and the one to the south. Um, we've proved to be a good neighbor and a good piece of the city on one of the central commerce streets in Sioux Falls, South Minnesota Avenue, for 25 years. 
and longer than that, going back to uh, the early 80s. Uh, I know the Silver Star people, and uh, I too know the qualities that they bring, and I'm looking forward to them uh, continuing to provide good commerce at 1500 South Minnesota Avenue. Thank you. All right, thank you, Bruce. Sierra Bruce on Sioux Falls. So this is gonna be right down on Minnesota Avenue by um, Slim Chickens and um, Freedom. If you go to their other location on Sycamore, they have traffic backed up to the road sometimes. So how is this going to work in a neighborhood? You have to remember, Minnesota is a busy, a busy street. How are they going to back up their course when they're waiting to come and wash their course through the, through the system here? I, su I, I support them 100%, but I don't think that this is a good location uh, to put, be putting a car wash there. We have, I mean, the car wash would be great, but whenever you back, when you have traffic backed up to get in there, where are they going to go? They're going to start backing up in neighborhoods, and then it's going to be a two-way street. It's going to make it into a one-way street, and then where are you going to go? Are, are, where, where's the people? Y'all you're looking at me like I'm crazy, but the, the building is going on the 1500 of Minnesota Avenue. So when there's backed-up traffic in that, where is the flow going to go while they're waiting to get their cars washed? That's going to be an issue. I'm thinking, if you would go and do your research and go to Sycamore, they have cars backed up on the road. So if you want me to take pictures of that, I can. I'll show you next Tuesday what I'm talking about. So we, we can't have the traffic congestion on Minnesota Avenue and flows into the neighborhoods here. So I, 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 I disagree with this uh, project here because it's, it's, it's going to be a uh, traffic jam here. We already have a, a mess right down Minnesota Avenue. We don't need um, to worry about a business with high traffic and high flow and to go get their cars washed here. So just take a look at their other location on Sycamore here and see how the traffic is backed up on the road on Sycamore. All right, thank you. Anyone else here to speak on this tonight? Come on forward. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, hello, Tom Borchard, uh, 1601 South Dakota. I got my notes on the phone, so I hope no one minds about that. Um, I am likely one of the few neighbors here tonight in support of the car wash, um, mostly because I have a little bit different perspective on the situation because I've got a little bit of history with it. Um, I lived on my home on Dakota Avenue for about four summers now. Um, the majority of the concerns I've heard through some of these things have been about the sound. My home is uh, closest to the proposed exit of the car wash, the noisiest possible place. Uh, Bruce mentioned the property on uh, that was 24th Street. I own the property on the south end of 24th Street. So the big tree directly parallel off of where the car wash exit will be. Um, previous renderings, I was closer to the vacuum station. I see that's been moved. Uh, I probably have the largest amount of fence line with the car the car wash that's going to be shared. I, I probably have probably the most worst case scenario exposure to where the car wash is going to be. But the sound was not my biggest concern at all when this. Uh, my biggest concern through this whole thing is if not Silver Star moving into my backyard, then what? Um, I've known the owners of JBB, Bruce, Jim, and Brian for going on 15 years now. I bought the house from them. Uh, I knew that they had intentions four years ago of selling this property when I bought the house. Uh, so I always knew that this was coming and I always worried about what could replace a car dealership because a car dealership's been a pretty good neighbor to me. Um, I think we could have a lot worse things moving on to our street. My worst case scenario list, I could ramble on for a while. I, I was paranoid about uh, late night, high traffic establishments, bars or restaurants, or the really worst case scenario would have been like some kind of like live music club or something like that. Other things that I really worried about were um, gonna get confirmed into a strip mall of sorts because we know every single strip mall in town has a liquor store and a vape shop in it. And I just worry about the foot traffic that enters into the neighborhood associated with those. Basically anything to do with late hours and weekends was my fear. 
uh, or just a lot of places that could potentially look at the place for the uh, large shop access. But uh, car washes, corporate headquarters seemed very reasonable to me. Now, I do obviously, of course, want them to manage the sound levels. I've heard that the city's gonna require them to meet 60 decibels, and at a previous meeting, they said that if they did not meet their 60 decibel goal, they would pull the plug, which I hope they reiterate again tonight and put into print. Uh, 60 decibels, according to the internet, is a very reasonable level. Uh, that means that they're actually gonna have to be quieter than Minnesota Avenue itself, which I can hear all night long in my driveway. My two concerns that I had with the property that was gonna be, that's being purchased, is the extremely aged fence and the late night traffic. Ever since the Freedom Gas Station converted into a glass shop, there's lots of people that walk down 24th Street, climb over my fence, and then go over to the glass shop. Uh, the Silver Star has already agreed to fix the fence, which will take care of the dilapidated fence and probably discourage the fence jumpers because it'll no longer look like a ladder, uh, which is effectively getting two birds stoned at once for me. So I'm not saying that the other concerns that people are have are not valid tonight. Um, a lot of the other things that I think are gonna happen with concerns are things that are gonna be present regardless of who moves into this building. Lots of people are worried about excessive more traffic on Dakota Avenue, which is a racetrack. I would really love if somebody addressed that on a separate topic. Some speed bumps wouldn't hurt. Um, whether whoever moves into this, we're going to see increased traffic on 23rd and 25th Street. All of these things will need to be addressed regardless of who's in this building. Overall, I'm in support of Silver Star because I see a reasonably quiet, friendly, locally owned company moving into my backyard that is going to take care of the location with pride versus a lot of other riffraff that could have moved into our neighborhood. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tom. Come on forward, sir. Hello. My name is Joel Walner. I live at 1513 South Dakota Avenue, directly behind the building there. I share a property fence line with the, uh, with the business. Um, I have a very young son. I know a lot of other people in the neighborhood on Dakota Avenue have young children as well. Uh, a big concern is, of course, traffic. Uh, as the previous speaker mentioned, it's a racetrack. It really is. There's people that go 45 miles an hour down that street. Uh, I feel that's a car wash in there. Um, although you can tell me that they'll take Minnesota Avenue, I'm pretty sure they'll want to take the route of least resistance, which would be Dakota Avenue. Uh, and people in a hurry going somewhere um, with all those small children around is a huge concern. Uh, another concern would be the noise. Um, I understand that they're trying to mitigate that with 60 decibels, um, and that's fine. I suppose 60 decibels is reasonable. Uh, my only concern is if it's not at that 60 decibel level, they say they're going to pull the plug, but who who is holding them accountable for that. How, if, they, if they're not meeting all of these propositions, who is the one enforcing them uh, is my question. Um, and then also having a car wash and if it's noisy with lots of traffic, we're a historic district. People move in there for the historic district. It's close to McKinnon Park. Uh, I'm very afraid that I'm going to lose value on my property because of a car wash being directly in my backyard. Uh, I have no qualms with the business themselves. I just don't want them right next to me. Um, that's really all I have. All right, thanks, Joel. Anyone else here to speak on this tonight? Good evening. Good evening, my name's Heather Taylor and I live at 1512. Uh, Dakota Avenue and I moved in there last August. Um, I'd like to reiterate that we are in a historical district. I think we're an important part of our community. My house is 88 years old. The house next to me is 104. We have people that are moving into these neighborhoods and reconditioning and revitalizing this neighborhood. It's slowly starting to move to the north. I don't want that to discontinue. We have a very young family across the street from me, and it's been fun to watch their little boy light off little snappers and fireworks. I don't want to lose that part of our neighborhood. I plan on this house being my retirement home. But I'm also a business owner, and I have a store on 41st in Minnesota. I've been in a lot of media discussions already. 
and most of those median discussions involving those businesses on South Minnesota talk about pushing traffic off of Minnesota because you're going to close our accesses on Minnesota Avenue to the residential neighborhoods behind our businesses. So already we've had a conversation about a median going down Minnesota Avenue in front of this car wash, and that's going to force all of that traffic and realize our worst fears that, again, the racetrack that is Dakota Avenue right now is going to become worse. It's one-sided parking, it's narrow, and honestly in bad shape. So I'm looking long-term versus six months from now. If you put a median in front of this business and you force people onto Dakota Avenue because you're going to close Minnesota accesses or cause U-turns to happen on a consistent basis, we will lose this historic neighborhood. And that's something that needs to be considered. Thank you. Anyone else this evening? All right. Seeing no other public. All right. Let's go. If you're ready to speak, come on up as soon as uh, the next person's done, please. Good evening. Hi there. My name is Mitchell Irons. Uh, I actually just moved into 1604 South Dakota Avenue on the June 30th. Um, we've got a couple concerns here. Um, the, the sound is something that we're, our, my wife and I are concerned about. Um, going till 8 a.m. This is just not something that, I just feel like something that could be quieter. Um, there's plenty of other businesses that should have the, or that could be in here other than a car wash. Um, they've got how many other locations in Sioux Falls? Um, there's one next to Costco that's less than two miles away, I believe. I just think that um, this is like a, the headquarters there, they're gonna be there by long after I die, I feel like, and I don't know, this just doesn't, uh, this isn't what I wanted to come move into. And um, so, yeah, that's my two cents. All right, thanks, Mitchell. Please come forward, sir. My name's Jason Matz, and I live on 1500 South Dakota Avenue. Appreciate your guys' time here tonight. Um, you guys are probably at the end of the road for us. You're our last hope. This process started last May, or this May, I should say. Um, I'm a USD graduate, poli-sci major, and what I'm taught in books seems to be different than in real life, kind of like back to school with Rodney Dangerfield. Um, we had one meeting with the commissioning meeting. We went, that went okay, it got deferred to the second one. Uh, I brought up to that commission meeting that both meetings were out of out of order because of their bylaws. That, that first meeting was over, overseen or was not paid attention. The second one, it was brought up to their attention, so then we had a, had a special meeting. I'm a big process person. I don't think this process has been very clean. I don't think it's been very handled very well by the city. One of the things I'm a little puzzled tonight is when you got Aaron Harmon presenting it for the contractor when he sits on the planning commission meeting. So he may have recused himself, but naive me, or maybe distrusting, is how can you trust that he didn't influence that commission for where we're at today? I've never been out against this project. I'm against some of the components that are in that project. Some of you have been on, on the emails, and I brought you into the loop, because a lot of the things that they put into this right now tonight didn't happen until this last week. My concern has always been about traffic. I got a neighbor here that's going to be talking, and, and they just said in their presentation that they're not going to change the access points. If that's true, then 25th Street's taken off the table, because right now that is not an access point. In our first meeting, that was not even discussed until another, or another um, neighbor brought it up and realized that they had bought that. The second meeting is suddenly on there. That 23rd exit, they're wrong and erred on that. Vernity only used that for the cars that they were working on whenever they, they were taking a test drive, so the traffic is very minimal. When you're looking at 156 cars and with that Minnesota Avenue and you're gonna push it to the interior, what, what's that to say? I, I, I kind of laughed because I got a, a brochure from the city for a walking tour about the historic district. I've got a house that sits less than 250 feet from there that you guys prominently got pictured in that brochure. And like Heather said, our neighborhood has changed drastically. It's gotten younger. We're here for the long haul. I, I guess I would hope that you would remand it back and we go back and talk about this traffic. 
I don't think right now it's just a bandage approach that is just being put on there and it's not dealing with the long-term programs. I agree with Mr. Eide, he's been, I bought several cars from him. I, I'm not disputing with Prime Star and what they can give to the community, but when you're talking a neighborhood and when you're talking as individual investors and houses there, I think that should be considered as well. I don't think that, you know, you can retrofit a building, but you can't retrofit a, a neighborhood. We've had several people, and you can go into the minutes, Jason's got it, we had between 20 to 15 people at each of those two meetings. Some of them have given up hope, some of them think the process is flawed, some of them think the decisions is made and the nails in the coffin. I'm not one of those people, because I would hope as elected officials that you'd be able to see and go back and look at what's been presented and also talk to the other city employees and see that it is and was flawed and that should, we should revisit this. Um, I don't think that the process, you know, they talk about having meetings. They had one meeting at four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, we got COVID epidemic. I don't think any of you can tell your boss, no, I gotta leave for a meeting on there. They, they, I think that, you know, they could have had more neighbors there, but it was at a different time. I mean, there's a lot of different things, and that was one of the things that was brought up in the planning commission meeting, to have a meeting there where people could attend. It was not. Four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, I guess I would hope to go back and talk. I hope that the plan would be is to push everything to Minnesota Avenue and stay off of the residential. I know this is a big project. I know what it could bring to the neighborhood. But like the one neighbor said, he's not concerned about the noise. He has a, he has a motorcycle that I can hear down at my corner of the neighborhood that he, he blares all the time with his wife. So the noise is a concern. I was tempted to have our other neighbor come and sit outside you guys tonight and just have him do the uh, throttle on his motorcycle to show you the noise that would be there. It'd be a constant noise. This is, a, this is gonna be a lifestyle change for the neighborhood. And it's gonna have long-term impacts. I agree we could have different things in there, but I think we could go and mediate and work this out and have it agreeable to all sides. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Jason. Anyone else to speak this, this evening on this? Bruce Danielson, I just had a, a, actually a message on my phone and somebody just asked me, why is this a petition? And if the clerk or Jason could explain the petition process for the people at home that are wondering why it didn't have a first reading, why we're having this, what appears to be a second reading on this. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any other public input tonight? Please come forward, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Sue Creel, and I actually have two properties that are involved in this. I have a business on the corner of 25th and Minnesota, AccuCare Physical Therapy, and I actually live next door to it at 407 West 25th. I've been in the neighborhood for 30 years and have not had issues that with any of the business neighbors, um, anything else, noise, lights. We get the Minnesota Avenue traffic, and I get that. Um, the concerns that are being brought forth, the noise, um, yes, they are going to do some landscaping. One of the things I brought up at one of the first meetings was, I don't care how many trees are planted, I want to know what size. They're proposing to, to plant one and a half to two inch saplings. That's not going to do anything. In contrast, I was able to watch the video from the planning meeting last week where Blue Wave car wash came in, they're going to plant five 10 to 12 foot evergreen trees as a buffer between them and their neighbors. They are working with those neighbors. They went and met with each neighbor individually and found their concerns, brought a resolution. There was, there was no one at the meeting that disagreed with anything they said. That has not been the case here. The, um, the fact that this is a historic district, Hayes Historic, as well as McKinnon Park. So you're looking at two different historic districts. I think that our perspective as people in that neighborhood that want to raise our families there, despite the criticism and the ridiculing that we, un we um, were given at the, the planning meeting, saying that people didn't understand why anyone would want to raise their family a block off of Minnesota Avenue. Um, 
we still believe in that historic district and want to see that it continues as it should be. There's, if, when we go back to the initial drawings, they've changed so many times, I can't tell you for sure what has happened. And I'm the person that met with Aaron to talk about the traffic flow. There has been a flurry of emails today, and I think most of you were in on that, about that traffic flow. The last one that just bowled me over was the fact that they're saying that the residential streets can hold up to 2,000 cars a day. I don't see that happening. On 25th, at any given time, and the traffic count that was offered up at this point is not indicative what is normal because we have COVID in place. We do not see the traffic and the parking that occurs from the other area businesses, Kaladis, Vanessans, that type of thing that normally occur on that street. On any given day, one car can go down that street. Multiple patients of mine have expressed concern that, man, if there's more cars, it's gonna make it difficult to get in here. They're right, it is. If, and I was quoted 150 to 200 cars a day out of that facility, I'm not gonna be able to back out of my single stall garage safely. My neighbor has two kids that are still in diapers right next to that property. Why now is it suddenly 25th is not an exit? That is not, has, has not been how it has been presented to us. My concern is if it's approved, that 25th Street is gonna become an exit and we have no way to go back on that and say this isn't appropriate. Why does, 20, why does the two lots have to be opened up if 25th Street is not an exit? If they've got the planned exit to be on Minnesota, like they're saying, why does 25th Street have to be the exit and why is that, that uh, the two plots have to be opened up for that? One of the plans we saw, saw that building knocked down and a parking lot there. Now the building's there. The occupants of the building now say that they were given an option to buy it, but they were told there would have to be a, an access point for traffic to come through there. That's gonna kill any business that wants to be in there. Nobody's gonna wanna be backing out into traffic coming up on them. I understand Mr. Eide has been a great neighbor. I have nothing against that. I also have nothing against the realtor. However, I feel that them speaking tonight are out of order from the standpoint, Mr. Eide wants to sell his building, the realtor wants his commission. That's not what needs to motivate this decision. Thank you, Sue. Sometimes we can't put a square peg in a round hole, and I think it's being forced. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else to speak on this tonight? Last call here. Good evening. Hi, Council. I'm Ryan Tisdall with Van Busker Companies. Uh, I'm the real estate agent who was hired to sell this property on Minnesota Avenue by JBB Ventures, which is a division of Vernity Motor Cars. After months of marketing this property that spans the length of two city blocks along Minnesota Avenue, we were excited to have Silver Star Car Wash come along um, and put the property under contract for purchase. Compared to the other potential buyers we've had, and the other alternative uses the property could become. Silver Star is definitely the most preferred user for the site and least impact on the neighborhood. And most of the other potential uses would not actually require a conditional use permit, leaving them free to repurpose the site without any city approvals. Keep in mind, a majority of the proposed project um, is actually being utilized as office space and non-car wash uses um, Silver Star's own staff is going to work at this location, which to me provides further assurances that the sound deadening technology that they're going to be used, I expect that to be 100% effective because they're going to be there themselves. The current use of the property um, includes an existing car wash that, quote, runs all day, according to the general manager of Vernity, and this site also houses several service bays that utilize loud air compressors, service equipment, and loud, uh, loud machinery. One thing that has not been mentioned tonight is that until a couple years ago, Vernity owned all the houses on the west side of Dakota Avenue uh, behind this property. 
and Vernides stuck a million dollars of their own money into fixing these houses up before they sold them purely as an effort to improve the neighborhood and increase the property values in the area. I can appreciate the challenges that the city faces as properties along these legacy arterial roadways turn over and they're converted to new users and tenants. Um, the alternative to supporting the evolution of these major roadways would be to have rundown desolate streets overrun with vacant properties, which we obviously don't want. As we listen to the neighborhood input tonight, it's important to listen to existing neighbors of Silver Star properties around Sioux Falls. I spoke with Rod Wolfell, who owns adjacent property to Silver Star on both East 10th Street and 85th in Minnesota. He has never once had any issue with Silver Star and noted they have been excellent neighbors who keep a nice looking property, and he describes them as first class. I talked to Travis Rhodes, who owns the Scooter's Coffee, located immediately next to Silver Star on 85th Street. I asked if he's ever had problems hearing customers order in his drive through as his menu board and microphone are located just over 50 feet away from Silver Star from their tunnel wash dryers at the exit of the car wash. He said he does not recall any issues even once. He also said Scooters has an outdoor patio at that location and they've never once noticed any sound on the patio from Silver Star. Phil Schmitz, the Phil Schmitz, the general manager of Hills of Rest Cemetery, told me he had a burial last week near the adjacent East 10th Street Silver Star car wash. He said you could not hear anything louder than regular street traffic and that there was no effect by Silver Star on the burial despite its close proximity to the car wash. Next, I spoke with Zach Negebauer, who owns property adjacent to the Sycamore Avenue Silver Star. He mentioned that he has never had any negative impact on his property from Silver Star, including noise, trash, or traffic congestion. In addition to nearby commercial owners, I also spoke with multiple residents who live immediately behind Silver Star on Sycamore Avenue. None of them have had any issues, and their comment, the comment that they all gave was, we don't even realize that they're there. In, my, in all of my questioning to them, there were no negative comments given by the people who literally live right behind Silver Star Car Wash. Keep in mind, their homes, the homes of the people I spoke with, are 50% closer to the tunnel wash and the vacuums than the proposed one that will be to any of the Dakota Avenue houses being represented this evening. I can appreciate the passion neighbors have for their neighborhood. I can also speak firsthand to the worst case scenarios painted by neighbors in most cases of this nature, which I know all of you can attest to as well. A few years back, I remember attending countless planning and city council meetings where Southside residents strongly opposed Walmart and the surrounding development. Many of the people in opposition were friends of mine or acquaintances of mine. Several of them have since said to me that they have experienced none of the negative effects the neighbors made claims of, such as traffic congestion, crime, increased noise, and light pollution. Thank you, Ryan. Anyone else to speak on this item tonight? Good evening. Good evening. I'm Wade Beam with uh, Peg Construction, representing uh, Silver Star here tonight as well. Um, 1300 West 57th Avenue. Uh, you know, we've got two, two things to talk about, uh, traffic and uh, sound. You know, uh, we have uh, uh, Shannon Austin uh, in the audience tonight, and I'm gonna let her uh, deal with most of the traffic. Um, you know, generally what we have, the plan that you see in front of you is a plan that uh, was created. The access points were left the way they were, um, placed the way they were, kind of in conjunction with the assumption that we are making about what Minnesota Avenue is going to become. Um, once again, I'll let Shannon talk about that, but uh, uh, with, with where we're at today and, and everything that we know, uh, you know, this is what we, we need to do to make our site flow correctly. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about Silver Star specific use and traffic generation. Uh, if you, you know, and I know that there was uh, some, some information that was being uh, passed around on traffic counts and, and uh, what these, uh, what this site can generate in terms of trip counts. 
And I think the only thing that I want to leave you with on that, and, and Shannon can uh, you know, reiterate some of these points about how traffic counts are generated and stuff, I'll, let, I'll leave that at the staff level. The traffic counts that we have as this use is much less than will be if it's you know, most any other retail use, uh, you know, a restaurant, anything else that can be go, go uh, into this site. So there's, there's a number of, and you've heard it already several times, I just wanna drive the point home, there's a lot of worse things that can go here for uh, use pedestrian traffic and, and especially traffic generation. Um, so I'll leave that at that for right now. I'll let Shannon uh, kind of talk about that when you get a chance to visit with her afterwards here. Um, so sound mitigation. Uh, you know, there, there is concerns always about car washes and sound mitigation. So I want to be clear that there is a performance standard in place that we are very well in tune with. We're very well, uh, uh, we know what the standard is. It's well addressed in chapter 93 of the Sioux Falls Code of Ordinances. I'm not gonna sit here and reiterate that to you. All we know is that we gotta hit 60 decibels at the residential property line. We know we can meet that. For those of you that may have caught some of the Planning Commission uh, uh, footage, uh, you heard us talk about uh, you know, meeting that standard and what we are going to do to meet that standard. Um, again, it's a performance standard. If we don't perform, I'll say it again the way I said it that night, you know, yes, we expect to be shut down. We expect to correct the issue before we continue operation. We absolutely will do a check with the health department uh, who enforces that standard uh, before we're allowed to open. So, I mean, again, Silver Star supports me as their contractor saying that. They, they're uh, a group with a lot of integrity. They, they want to live harmoniously with this neighborhood. Um, they want to be a part of this neighborhood. And so, I mean, we're going to meet the standard. One of the things uh, that I want to just touch back on again is the things that we committed to. The, you know, there are four very clear conditions that the Planning Commission came up with. And uh, I want to actually state that those conditions were come up with, you know, were, were arrived at in concert with several of the neighbors who were very active early on in the planning commission process. So we have worked closely with the neighbors on those, on those items. And you know, those conditions that are in place are fine. They're fine with us, we're fine with them carrying forward. Uh, one of those conditions uh, is, the, is the screen fence. So the screen fence that's in place, you've heard it's, it's, it's in disrepair. Very first uh, neighborhood meeting, which was held in a COVID friendly environment, uh, you know, we agreed to replace that and replace it with something that was a little more um, uh, sound friendly. I see my time is coming to uh, a close here. One of the last things I wanna leave you with is, is you know, the blue wave car wash uh, that was approved last week at Planning Commission was something that you know, their, their position, their, their uh, application is a little different than, or is, is, is very similar to ours. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, we just wanna be held to the same standard. They only had two conditions placed, six foot screen fence and some trees. We wanna be held to the same standard, so. Thank you, Wade. All right. Heard a lot of uh, pros and cons of this project too. Is there anyone else who didn't get a chance to speak tonight? All right, we'll move into uh, our council discussion. First, I'm gonna ask any counselors, do you have any disclosures of evidence or information you've got uh, that you didn't hear at the hearing and haven't been posted online? I'll start with Councilor Neitzert. Yeah, uh, was reiterated, but just to be uh, very transparent, I watched both planning commission meetings. I had a call with Paul Cheddar, who's one of the neighbors. I don't think he was able to be here tonight. Um, and he reiterated essentially his, his concern that the conditions that are in place right now, that he wanted to make sure that they stuck tonight and that we, we, we didn't uh, go back on any of those. And then finally, I did meet with um, one of the Silver Star owners, uh, the engineer, and uh, 
weighed the construction uh, from the construction company on site with a few other people and I'm not sure that I heard anything or saw anything that was that I didn't hear tonight. It, essentially, we saw the fence and what it looked like and talked about what the new fence would look like. The current use saw the car wash tunnel where the vacuum is going to be and, and those sorts of things. So th that would be my disclosures. All right. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sale. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, like Councillor Neitzert, I did take a site visit with the developer and the engineer. Uh, and I also did speak to several of the neighbors throughout the day in the last couple of days, received some emails. No new information that was not presented here or in front of us was given to me at that time. All right. Thank you, Councillor Sale. Councillor Steely. Um, well, the, one of the, the people who spoke talked about um, process. And I will have to say that until today, I saw it on Facebook. One of the people from the, the McKinnon Park area had a, a thing, and they were mentioning Kurt Sale's name. Did you see that, Councillor Sale? They, yeah, they had your name and your phone number saying, this is a, a problem. Reach out to our council member, Kurt Sale. We'll reach out to Kurt Sale three times. His name was mentioned and the phone number. No one had reached out to me. And then uh, during the day, I saw some emails coming in. So for me, this is all kind of fresh information coming out. And the public needs to understand, if we don't hear from you early on, then we, we can just assume. We're just, dis we're just disclosing okay. information right. you may have gotten. We'll okay. have a time for discussion okay. here shortly. So, so that is there any other information to disclose, Councillor um, Kyler? I also did a site visit. Uh, along with several other counselors, uh, and uh, there was no information disclosed then that was not disclosed this evening. Okay, thank you. And Councilor Councilor Selberg, same visit, but no new information. Same visit, Councilor Erickson, I believe it was. I just will say ditto. Ditto, got it. Okay, Mr. Mayor, Councilor Starr. Yes, Councilor Brecky wants to weigh in. Go. Go ahead, Councillor Brecky, and then we'll go to you, Councillor Starr. Yeah, I just wanted to mention too earlier that today I was at the meeting at the beginning of the meeting, but I reached to unmute myself and I accidentally pushed decline, so I lost myself and came back. So I've been here the whole time, um, and I did. I just wanted, yeah, I didn't receive anything um, different, just emails and you know some some contact um, from the Vernity Group, uh, but other than that, uh, nothing that wasn't disclosed tonight. Thank you. All right, Councilor Starr. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess there were a couple of things in a, a couple of email chains that I think we got most of them online. I haven't had a chance to check to make sure that they're posted, but at least I've had a chance to look at those emails that came in late this afternoon, and uh, uh, I don't believe there was any other new information that wasn't reiterated tonight. So I tried to get most of them posted as fast as I could, so our staff's done a pretty good job of that. So right, thank you. All right, so now we'll move forward to uh, get a motion on the table, and then we'll move into discussion on this. Move to approve. Second for that? I'll, I'll second with the conditions that were proposed by the Planning Commission, just to be clear. All right, which is the motion itself. So the yes. item yep. as read into record is that. So Perfect, thanks. Motion by Kylie, seconded by Neitzert. Now we'll move into a discussion on this item. Councillor Sale, I'll start with you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, after having several phone calls today and the last few days and meeting with it and researching this, and uh, I've come, I'm going to give you several observations before I tell you what. The traffic questions, I also have questions about the traffic to make sure that we're not dumping commercial business into residential neighborhoods. It's an issue in the core part of Sioux Falls. Now, I do trust the people that know more about traffic in the city than I do, and their interpretation of how much a residential street can take is based on science, not on my personal observations. On my street, on Glendale, I'd like to see two cars a day. I'd like to see my wife come home, and I'd like to see my, myself come home. So I don't want a lot of cars on my street either. But according to our traffic engineers, they could handle more. I tell you, I go to Dairy Queen just down the road from this uh, quite often, and there's a backup in traffic there, especially on a night like tonight. Uh, hopefully I can get there before it closes, uh, to tell you the truth. So traffic is an issue for me, but when I look at their site plan, and if they come in off of 25th Street and line up two uh, side by side 
for a whole city block before they get in the tunnel, that's going to alleviate a lot of cars, a lot of cars. And if they continue out of the tunnel, turn and come back on Minnesota Avenue, I'm very happy with that. As people once in a while going to turn on 23rd? Yes. I understand that's going to happen. And I would request that the owner of the business put a sign up to say, exit this way, take a left, circle around, come out on Minnesota. And to address the, the, the mythical medium on Minnesota that has sometimes been talked about, I just can't ever in my lifetime see that happen. A, the cost. You're going to have to acquire a lot of property along Minnesota. You know, and I've mentioned this to several of you today, you know, the, the 429 as it started, and now it's Highway 101. And, well, that was supposed to have been done years ago. We're decades away from that happening. So sometimes when they say we're going to have this money, we're going to do this stuff for traffic, it doesn't come about. And I can guarantee you that the state of South Dakota is going to be a little short on sales tax funds this year, and they're not going to want to move things ahead as fast as they do. When it comes to the sound, that is a concern of mine. I see from the it, Johnson Environmental did the report, and they say it should be fine. When it comes to who takes care of that if there's problems, we do have a whole division of code enforcement that takes care of that. And you heard from the developer that if that doesn't meet those standards, they're not going to do it. So I've kind of crossed that off my list of concerns. But to the neighborhood, if, it can, if they do it and they're not meeting the 60 decibels, please give me a call. Please give me a call because we'll get right into it. And for those people that are concerned about the historical part of the neighborhood, I am too. This does not move anything closer to the historical district. It's already zoned commercial. There could be a strip mall put in there. There could be a Dairy Queen put in there. There could be uh, 7-Eleven. There could be a lot of other things that would create a lot more traffic and a lot more noise. So when all of that is put together, the concerns of the neighbors I see on the final plan, based on where it started to have the meetings, I can see that some of the stuff has already been put in here. Where they've moved the vacuum, what the speed bumps are, how the car wash tunnel is going to be lowered, what they're going to do for the trees. I did talk to somebody about the trees today. Could we put in bigger trees? And it was relayed to me that a larger tree does not grow very much in the first few years, that the two-inch tree will grow. Now, I'm not an arborist, and I would request that when you do put in the trees, put in the ones that are going to stop the sound, and we'll, we'll trust somebody that's an arborist to do that. With all of those things said, this I believe this is appropriate use of this property, and I'm going to vote for it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Staley? So back to what I was starting to say before is that uh, I hadn't heard from the neighbors. I wasn't invited to go to any site visits. So the first thing I started hearing about this was today. Now, perhaps that's because I'm on my way out the door, and we've got a replacement coming in, but I'm here to vote today. <laughs> so. It, it's so Im important for people to reach out to us ahead of time. And apparently some of my, my colleagues got that reach out. I did not. And I have a feeling some of you didn't, weren't told that you should be reaching out to us before today or earlier on. Okay, so I'm seeing that firm there. So I'm going to make a motion to defer this because um, if, it, if I was still going to be on the council, I would make this motion anyway. I'd say, you know, I want to come out and, and actually eyeball this area. I want to meet with you. I want to hear from you before we vote, um, just to give you that due process that you deserve. However, I'm, I won't be here after tonight. So what, I, uh, what I'd like to do is I'm going to make a motion to defer this to July 21st, and that will give my replacement ample time to hear, hear the same information and maybe give you a little more time to just to, to feel comfortable with that you've been heard and that everything is, is as solid as it can be. And I will tell you, in four years on the council, there, there is always some wiggle room. Okay, there's always some neg negotiational area. So making that motion to defer this to July 21st. Is there a second, Star? All right, motion and a second. Is there any discussion on that? Uh, Councillor Neitzer? This has been noticed for several days. Anybody had an opportunity to go out and visit the site if they wanted to do due diligence? I, I just suggest that we move forward. This has been to the Planning Commission twice. It's been going on for, I think, maybe about three months now. 
Mr. Mayor. Councillor Starr. Yes, thank you. And I, I agree with Councillor Neitzert that there has been plenty of notice. This has been uh, held back a couple of times because it is a big issue. It's, a, it's important to our community. A couple of weeks aren't going to change that uh, in the process. And really, a lot of the conversation has already started. I sent this email today. I reassured people today. Um, there's a chain of emails that happened today that are, people are trying to understand what's included in the proposal um, to take a look at. And you know what, in a two week amount of time, some of the neighbors had already said that uh, they didn't feel like they understood totally the proposal. I think there's a chance in, in two weeks that we can get a lot closer to uh, getting everybody to approve this and to, to at least understand uh, what has changed and where we're going forward. Again, every time that government, government's slow, and it, a lot of the times it should be, because we need to make sure we get everybody on board. At different times, uh, folks get a chance to uh, understand what's going on and miss meetings or miss notices, no matter how much we do that, and taking an additional two weeks in the big picture of this um, major change along Minnesota Avenue, I don't think is unwarranted at this point. All right, other discussion on the council? I'm gonna go to the phone first. Anybody on the phone? All right, Councillor Steely. Well, and, and just to, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm disappointed that Councillor Neitzert has this attitude that because you hadn't reached out to some of us, that then you're gonna get penalized. Citizens don't always understand what the time frame is. And so I think some of you are here today expressing your views for the first time. And I know there were other people who sent emails who are not here. So due process is so important. And again, I won't be there, but I'm gonna give my the guy taking my place a chance to, to listen and maybe reach out to you and, and to do that site visit that I wasn't informed about. We have to, so, we get so much information coming at us, sometimes we have to gear our response to the response we get from you. So Thank I appreciate you. that you were here today, but again, I, I would hope that we could, it does, it's not gonna hurt anything to put this off for two weeks. Thank you. Any other discussion on the motion to defer? All right, let's take a vote on it then, please. Council Member Selberg? No. Sale? No. Star? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? No. Erickson? No. Kylie? No. Neitzert? No. All right, that motion fails six to two. We're back to discussion on the original motion. Look for any di other discussion, Councilor Kylie. Thank you. Uh, during my site visit, which was a, a, a few weeks ago, and I don't believe there's been any information presented tonight that was presented to me differently two weeks ago. Um, but when I first pulled up on the site, uh, it exists today, and I want to make this very clear again, there's already a car wash in existence on this site. And when I pulled up, it was actually a vehicle was going through it, and the doors came up with the blowers, and I dismissed myself to the, from the group, walked around to the back side of the building with the blowers just a matter of feet away, and I could still hear the volume of the Minnesota traffic over the top of the blowers. So I, I think in terms of what can be controlled, the sound certainly can be. The uh, Silver Star owner, ownership group has indicated that they'll put in the sound barriers, especially adjacent the exit uh, of the tunnel. They're going to improve the fence and they're gonna maintain uh, the nice pillars that already exist and build a, a fence in between that is more suitable for, for blocking sound. Uh, they're going to landscape. Uh, they're actually going to improve the property and clean up the property. And, and I know that the IDs have been good neighbors. They were good neighbors when they were down at 33rd Minnesota and they're good neighbors here. And I'm sure that Silver Star is gonna be good neighbors as well. And the other thing that weighs heavily on, in my decision is there's at least four other car washes that I'm aware of along Minnesota Avenue. And there has been one down in 37th in Minnesota since as long as I've been around because I grew up in that area. Um, Minnesota Avenue, as Councillor Sale has indicated, is owned commercial. It's commercial now. It's going to remain uh, commercial. They will be held to the 60 decibel 
uh, uh, threshold. Um, so based on that, uh, and, and the other factor too was the employee parking. It's going to be better than what it has been because there's plenty of space on the lot for, for their staff where that has not been the case with a car lot because obviously the spaces, many of the spaces are filled with cars to be sold. So based on those things, I will be supporting this item. All right, thank you, Councillor. Any other discussion on this item on the Council? Councillor Neitzer? I, I do want to talk about a couple of things, and, and we all do listen to all sides, and it's a matter of doing due diligence and trying to balance concerns with also having good and coherent city policy. Um, first, I want to touch on the, the noise ordinance issue, because I have some intimate familiarity with that. Uh, a few years back, there was an issue with uh, the Icon Lounge downtown and with sound there. And I spent a good deal of time working on that. And I, I talked, I was at Icon, I talked to their ownership. I was actually in a couple of units at the apartments or the condos next door where the complaints were coming from. And I saw how that, how that worked out. There was a complaint and the police went out and they issued warnings and then they, uh, if I remember right, they may even have cited the business. And that business had no choice but to, to, to fix a problem. And they spent upwards of seventy or $80,000, I think it was, on sound mats and a lot of other, other things. And they had to do that. And I was there a few times where at 10.30 at night, and this happened randomly too, where the sound, the, the people who enforce, enforce sound in the health department, they would go out there randomly and they'd have their sound meter and they'd check it. And they had to be in compliance and if they weren't in compliance, they talked to them and they had to make improvements and they got it to where it needed to be. If there's a complaint, they will be out there and there is an enforcement mechanism, there's fines and before they can open, they're gonna stand there and they have a meter and it shows the L90 at the property line. If it says 62 decibels, they're not going to let them open. They're going to make them do more, and that's an objective standard, and, and that's going to have to happen. And if down the road somebody calls and complains and says it's too loud, they're going to go out there and they're going to check it. And if it's a problem, there's going to be a notice of violation, and they're going to have to correct it, and they're going to make them do it. So, um, and, and I would tell you that the sound on Minnesota Avenue is pretty loud, and I suspect at times you may measure it, and it may be louder than what the car wash is generating. So I, I just want to make sure that it's clear that everybody is held to that same standard and it is enforceable. In, in terms of the, the traffic, and traffic calming is a, a big thing for me, and I did talk to uh, one of the citizens about this. There's things that can be done, and I gave him the phone number and email of our traffic engineer to talk about, because on any road we want to make sure we, we, we have safety. And I'll, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll admit it, I have... Um, I go to certain businesses uh, down near 26th Street, and on occasion, it, instead of making an uncontrolled left-hand turn, I'll take a side street, and then I'll drive down Nakoda, and I try to drive slow, but I'll use it. It happens. Um, that's true of any business on Minnesota. There's just going to be some issues. I don't think it's really excessive. When you look at this, it's going to be something. The question is, what is it going to be? So we have to be careful not to fall into the fallacy of comparing nothing to this. You have to compare this to many other things. And if this was a convenience store in a small strip mall, the traffic generation would be factors above this. I've heard numbers thrown around such as 150. If that's anywhere near true, take that and divide that by whatever their hours are, 12 hours or something like that, then divide it by the minutes and, and, and the seconds, and you're gonna find that it's, it's, it's a completely insignificant number. And th that even assumes everybody would go down the side streets, which that, that's not gonna happen. Most people will take passive lease resistance. So those are the, the two big things. And, and in terms of what Councillor Sale was talking about, at some point, there may be a median, but to get the necessary right-of-way, I think you're probably going to have to buy up and down the street right-of-way from hundreds of property owners, and you're going to have to figure out how to close off accesses. It's going to be incredibly difficult, but let's say even if it does happen someday, whether it's a car wash or anything else, 
that debate about whether or not to be closing accesses and having medians and, and diverting traffic to side streets, it's going to be there anyway for all of the hundreds of businesses going up and down. This is not a silver star issue. This is more of just a, a policy decision. So I think it's going to be a, a great use. They will be held to a standard. They've done things. If you've seen the fence, the fence right now, it's not a solid fence. There's gaps. It's, it's panel, gap, panel. It's as the, the, the sound study says, it's not really doing anything for sound. They're going to have a solid fence, and they're going to do all of those things to to get to the performance. So, I, I think it really will be an will be an asset, and they're doing the things I think that are going to be very sensitive. And you, you many times have to be careful what you what you wish for, because sometimes you may defeat something that's a wonderful project, and what you see come from it can be far worse, because if you look at the zoning ordinance, there's a lot of things that could happen without coming to us at all that would be much, much, quote unquote, worse for the neighborhood. And uh, I think it was Tom who made reference to that, had very eloquent comments to that effect. So thank you. Councilor Shelberg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, a lot of good points have been made already. I won't reiterate on a number. I think what I'd maybe add to the conversation is my personal experience as far as with organization and maybe a similar type of setup where I'm from the Southwest. I've seen this operation that they have in the Southwest, which is off 69th and Louise, extremely busy. Uh, I'm sure many of you have been there plenty of times and know what the traffic is out in that direction too. I've used that car wash. It's always busy, but I've never, it's, as far as I'm, I'm kind of talking to the standards of what I've seen basically as far as traffic and how they handle it from what I've seen in a really heavily trafficked area. I've never seen cars piled up more than three deep. Things get through pretty darn quick. I think any time I've been there, I've been out of there in about 10 minutes and they've got high standards and cleanliness and orderly. And the thing is at that location, even when you come out of the car wash, and some of you may know this or if you haven't been there, it's actually kind of a goofy when you leave, you have to go in front of a culver's to kind of get out and you'd think, boy, this is just tailor-made for a traffic jam or something. I haven't quite figured out how it's set up, but I have yet to be stuck in traffic there or behind a bunch of cars or anything either. So I guess I'm adding this to the fact of, of personal experience, seeing how they run an operation, how that's been done. I've got to think that that's got to play something into this as well as far as how it's going to work here if people are worried about cars being hanging out in over which direction. So I'd throw that into the, uh, the point with it and I will be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. All right, any final discussion on the Council on this? Councillor Starr, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think one of the things that I would do to challenge our whole community is to, to go from Russell Avenue and go south on Minnesota Avenue and go to 41st Street. That corridor needs investment. Um, there are a lot of great investments that are already going along that area, but that part of our town um, is challenged right now. And finding a quality business um, that's willing to invest in the community is important. But so is the investment that the neighbors are making in a historic district. And so balancing those two things, I think, are, are critical. And with this, I, I'm, I'm on the side of the neighborhood in this. I think there are challenges and I think there are things that we can do better to make this project better. And if that just involves uh, getting the neighborhood on board and seeing that investment, um, I, I would be in favor of that. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm struggling because again, this is a great company. It's a locally owned company that uh, does a great job in our community, but so are the neighbors. The neighbors have done a great job of investing in that neighborhood um, and, and they deserve to be heard and uh, be able to be at least appeased a little bit to know that uh, their quality of life is going to continue as well. So with that, when I have to balance and, and struggle, I, I'm just not going to be able to support this. Thanks. Right, thank you, Councillor. Any other discussion, Council? Mayor. Councillor Brecky, go ahead. That was I, similar to, to Pat Starr, but I come to a different conclusion. That's what I'm looking for in these situations. I'm looking for, you know, always in these situations, a, a necessary balance between the needs of business and the needs of the neighborhood. And in, you know, as the emails I received and the other correspondences I received, it seemed to be writing itself before it even got to us, to me. And it seems that really all of the issues that the neighborhood was, you know, has raised you know, have been addressed by the owners, and now we just need to, you know, go ahead and move forward, you know, and, and
and make sure that, you know, those promises are kept. And so I feel like the balance has been achieved, um, the contacts have been made, and the neighbors have been listened to, and so I'm, I'm willing to proceed tonight and make a decision, and I will be supportive. Thank you, Counselor. All right, uh, hearing no other discussion from the Council, I think we're ready to call in a vote on this item, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? No. Staley? No. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. All right, that item passes six to two. Next item, please. Item 51, rescind the 2020 retail and wine and cider license and 2019-20 retail malt beverage South Dakota farm wine license for Expedition League Incorporated, 1401 West 33rd Street. Item 52, transfer of 2020 package liquor license from the from the market on Phillips LLC, 196 East 6th Street, Suite 101 to New Ritual LLC, the Hello High, 120 South Phillips Avenue, CUP not required. Item 53, transfer of 2020 retail wine and cider license from T-SLAT LLC, JJ's Axes and Ales, 4810 Southwestern Avenue to, to TJ's LLC, JJ's Axes and Ales, 3016 West 57th Street, CUP not required. Item 54, new 2020-21 retail malt beverage, South Dakota farm wine license for JJ's Axes and Ales, 3016 West 57th Street, CUP not required. Item 55, transfer of 2019-20 retail malt beverage, South Dakota farm wine license from Quick and Easy LLC, 2500 West Madison Street to W&J Enterprises LLC, 2500 West Madison Street, CUP not required. Item 56, renewal 2020-21 retail malt beverage, South Dakota farm wine license for W&J Enterprises LLC, 2500 West Madison Street. Item 57, transfer of 2019-20 retail malt beverage, South Dakota farm wine license and 2020 retail wine and cider license from Myers LLC, 221 South Phillips Avenue to Analog Sandwich Incorporated, 81, 221 South Phillips Avenue. Item 58, renewal of 2020-21 retail malt beverage, South Dakota farm wine license for 81, 221 South Phillips Avenue. Item 59, special one-day liquor license for TNT Entertainment Wiley's to be operated at Albert House parking lot, 337 North Phillips Avenue for a concert on July 17, 2020. Item 60, special one-day malt beverage license for Home Builders Association of Sioux Falls Empire. 6904 Southland Crest Place for members appreciation on July 30th, 2020. Item 61, special one-day malt beverage and special one-day wine licenses for commemorative Air Force Joe Foss Squadron to be operated at the Maverick Air Center, 4201 North Maverick Place for a fundraiser on July 31st, 2020. Item 62, special one-day malt beverage and special one-day wine licenses for the Multicultural Center, Sioux Falls, 515 North Main Avenue for a fundraiser on August 1st, 2020. Jamie, what are you still doing here? Oh, I don't know. It's almost my bedtime. <laughs> um, I am happy to answer any questions that you have for items 51 through 62. Um, and then also, um, it was just brought to my attention that item 59, there was a date change um, for that concert to be um, July 24th. So we would need to make an amendment on that item. Got it. All right, counselors, do you have any questions for Jamie on any of these? Do you have, Councilor Kiley, go uh, ahead. I'll, I have a motion. Uh, motion to approve items 51 through 58 and items 60 through 62. All right. We have Second. A motion from Kylie, seconded by sale on that. Any discussion, council, on that? All right, let's take a vote on that one, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero. Councilor Kylie? Yes, Mr. Mayor, move to amend item number 59 to read July 24th, 2020. Second. Okay, motion to amend and a second. Uh, any discussion on that? All right, let's, let's take a vote on that, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero, and now we need a motion to approve it, correct? Yes, sir. You want to make that? Yes, motion to approve. All right, motion to approve it. Second. Seconded by sale. Uh, let's take a vote on that, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? 
Yes. Riley? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero. Next item, please. Item 63, second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota rezoning property located at 416 North Nesmith Avenue from the RT1 single family residential traditional district to the RT2 townhome residential traditional district number 12175 2020 and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval four to zero. Uh, the applicant here is Gene Murphy, the owner is James Bunker. It's located at 416 North Nesmith Avenue. It's about 0.14 acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this rezoning is the uh, applicant is looking to correct the, the zoning with the current use of the property. Uh, it's currently a two unit converted house. All right, thanks Jason. Anyone from the public here to speak on this one? Councilor, you got any questions for Jason on it? Look for a motion. Move approval. Second. All right, motion by Selberg, seconded by Kylie to approve this item. Any discussion? All right, let's vote on it, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. All right, that passes seven to zero. Next item. Item 64, second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located east of North Marion Road and north of Interstate 90 from the AG Agricultural and C2 Commercial Neighborhood and Streetcar Districts to the I-2 Heavy Industrial District, number 12173-2020, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval 4-0. Uh, we do have a request from the applicant to defer this to the July 14th City Council meeting. Uh, we have an item later on where we need to correct the annexation resolution uh, before it's sent over to the county. So this one then needs to get uh, deferred one week and then we can vote on it next week. So, All right, can I get a motion to defer to uh, next week's meeting? So moved. Second. Okay, motion by Kylie, seconded by Sale on that. Uh, any discussion there? All right, let's vote on that one, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Staley? Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. All right, that passes 7 to 0. Item 65? Item 65, second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located at 2001 East A Street from the S2 Institutional Campus. PUD to the S1 General Institutional District number 12168-2020 and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval 4-0. Uh, the applicant here is Stacy McMahon. The owner is Sioux Falls Ministry Center. It's at, located at 2001 East A Street. Uh, it's roughly 13.77 acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this rezoning is uh, the Sioux Falls Ministry Center is looking at selling off kind of the northeast portion of the vacant lot and then the Children's Inn is looking at constructing their new facility on the lot. Uh, it's important to note that the uses uh, that it currently exist on the property that are allowed and what it's going to are essentially the same. It's really that uh, this whole property is not really functioning anymore like a planned unit development. It's really uh, different entities kind of doing their own thing, so we just kind of wanted to get it zoned out of that PUD so Children's Inn can do their own thing, and then if they sell that other property south of the Children's Inn, they can do their own thing kind of a deal. So. All right, thanks, Jason. Anyone from the public who would like to speak on this item tonight? All right, Councilor, you got any questions for Jason or the applicant? Councilor Seale? Jason. My understanding, the history of this property, it was owned by the state of South Dakota and then sold to the Ministry Association at a discount from the origin, from the price that had been listed. The plans that I saw at that time had soccer fields here that were going to be used for to extend the ministry and so there could be coaches and mentors and things like that. My question for you, and maybe it's the owner, if this property is sold, it's not based on the original plan that was uh, given to the governor in the state of South Dakota. Who receives the proceeds for this sale of the property? I would assume it'd be the Sioux Falls Ministry Center, but I know Rich with them is here, and that might be a better question for him, I would, would guess. Come forward, Rich. Good evening. Rich McCorris, 2312 South Bramer, representing the Empower Campus. On the board of directors, thank you for your question, Councillor. Great question. Let me make one thing really clear. We did not get a discount from the state of South Dakota on the purchase of this property. We paid over the appraised value of the, of the property. When we bought the property from the state of South Dakota, we had a variety of ideas of what we were going to use the open green space for. 
a couple of the options we looked at were potentially public green space after conversation with the uh, uh, local leaders, the mayor's office, other nonprofits in town, it became clear that the Children's Inn was the greatest use that collaborated with the other spaces that we're using on the rest of the campus. And so we're selling it to them. The funds that we're selling it to them just go to us to help pay the bank, um, the, the bank on it. So I hope that provides a little bit of clarity on, on where it's at. Thank you. Any other questions tonight? Councilor Starr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, it, it's unfortunate that, that this facility is needed in our community, but it's needed in our community. And I'm excited that the Children's Home Society uh, is stepping up and providing this resource for women and children who are going to use this facility. Um, we see each month the, the numbers continue to rise and they are maxed out in their space. One of the things we did when we were first elected to the council four years ago was to tour a lot of those places. I think Councillor Selberg called us the Fab Four in a lot of those tours. Um, but this was one of the tours that really stuck out in my mind and the amount of services that Children's Inn was providing and the limited amount of space that they had. And again, it's unfortunate that uh, this is needed in our community, but the need is going to be met with this facility. So I wholeheartedly support this, uh, this sale and rezoning. Any other questions for our staff or the applicant? Someone want to make a motion on this item? I would move to approve. Second sale. All right, motion by star, seconded by sale on this. Discussion on the council? Councilor, uh, Councilor Sale, sorry. Yes, I'd like to just follow up with my question with just a uh, point. I wholeheartedly support this, and I, I applaud those people that have future vision for what this could be. And I think this is, like Councilor Starr said, greatly needed, and I appreciate what you guys are doing. But that question has been asked of me several times, and I just wanted to make sure it was out there in public. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, Councilor. Any other discussion on the council on this item? All right, let's take a vote on it then, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. All right, that item passes 8-0. to zero. Item 66. Item 66, second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located at 916 South 9th Avenue from the RD1 Twin Home Duplex Residential Suburban District to the RT1 Single Family Residential Traditional District, number 12165-2020, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval 4-0. Uh, the applicant owner here is Habitat for Humanity. It's located at 916 South 9th Avenue, just north of the Avera McKinnon main campus. It's about 0.13 uh, acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this rezoning is Habitat for Humanity is looking at constructing a single family house on this uh, vacant lot of less than 50 feet wide. Thanks, Jason. Anyone from the public who would like to speak to this one tonight? Councilors, you got any questions for Jason on this? Second. Motion by Selberg, seconded by Kylie to approve this item. Discussion, councilors? All right, let's call for a vote, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. All right, that item passes 8 to 0. Next item. Item 67, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, authorizing the mayor to enter into Joint participation agreement among Sanford Health, Avera McKinnon Hospital, and University Health Center, City of Sioux Falls, Minnehaha County, South Dakota, and Sioux Empire Triage Center. Good Hi, evening. Alicia. Good evening, City Council. Alicia Kalura, Assistant Director of Public Health. I'm here to continue the progress of the Triage Center, or LINK. Tonight is the second reading of the ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into a joint participation agreement among Sanford Health, Avera McKinnon Hospital, and University Health Center the City of Sioux Falls and Minnehaha County, as well as the Sioux Empire Triage Center Board. The Joint Participation Agreement defines a cooperative forum and a funding approach between all four entities, City, County, Avera, and Sanford in support of LINK. Services of the LINK will include sober sobering center and medical detox, psychiatric acute care services, substance use disorder assessment, case management, and referral to community-based services. The agreement that you have before you has been signed by the Sioux Empire Triage Center Board, Sanford, Avera, and Minnehaha County, and is ready for your final consideration. Thanks, Alicia. Anyone from the public care to speak on this item tonight? All right, counselors, you got questions for Alicia on this one? 
Move to approve. Second, Neitzer. Motion by Kylie, seconded by Neitzer to approve this item. Discussion amongst the council. All right, seeing none, let's take a vote on it, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. All right, that passes seven to zero. Item 68. Item 68, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, authorizing the issuance of its storm drainage system revenue bonds in one or more series to the South Dakota Conservancy District, authorizing the use of the proceeds thereof for capital improvements, pledging the storm drainage system revenue of the city to the payment of said storm drainage system revenue bonds, fixing the terms of such storm drainage system revenue bonds, authorizing the execution and delivery of a loan agreement between the city and the South Dakota Conservancy District and authorizing the execution and delivery of such storm drainage system revenue bonds to the South Dakota Conservancy District not to exceed $9,457,400. All right. Welcome, Andy. Good evening, Council and Mayor. Uh, Andy Berg, Public Works, here tonight uh, for first reading on the ordinance to uh, secure a loan agreement for uh, three upcoming drainage projects that we're looking to fund in existing areas of the city. With me tonight is Aaron Fagerness. He is our new principal drainage engineer. Uh, some of you have dealt with Lance Weatherly in the past. Aaron is in his position now. So Aaron and I look forward to serving you with any of your future drainage needs. <laughs> um, project locations. Uh, sorry, I have to pull up the slide show. You hope you never need to talk to them, to be honest with you. I hope you get no phone calls, Aaron. <laughs> oh, who can help? Who can help poor Andy out? I don't get here Jason, very often. I apologize. Jason, you know how this thing works? Yeah. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> You can, you can fax it to us later, right. Andy. I'm going to go quick, so sorry for go. the delay. Uh, there are three project locations with that are, this loan will be funding. Um, I'm going to step through each of them. They're Basin 104, uh, Basin 95, and Basin 371. They are all in the west-southwest part of the city. Uh, Basin 104 is the final phase of a project to improved drainage at the 49th and Louise location. Uh, as you've probably heard over the years, that's a pretty significant flooding area. Uh, with the 49th and Louise intersection improvements, we installed box culverts extending to the east to the project limits. This will then be picking up where those box culverts ended and extending that to the oxbow that out near uh, the Butterfly House and Outdoor Campus, which drains through the levee and into the river. So very excited to get this corridor completed for those drainage improvements. Basin 95 drainage improvements. Uh, this is uh, north of 57th Street along Holbrook Avenue. Uh, as you can see on the exhibit, there's a multitude of improvements just with pipes, inlets, uh, improving the capacity in areas that were not meeting design standards. And we are also working with uh, the neighborhood on some areas for possible detention to be added as well. In Basin 31 drainage improvements, this is between 41st Street and uh, 26th Street along Sertoma Avenue. Uh, this involves some significant drainage channel and culvert improvements under some uh, dr streets draining to what we call the Roosevelt Pond and then also an expansion of the existing detention volume in that pond as well. We're proposing to secure state revolving fund loan 42 or SRF loan 42 for this for $9 million to fund these improvements. The interest rate will be 2% over a 10 year period. 1% uh, of that will be turned back in non-point source funds to the city for spending on water quality efforts in the Big Sioux watershed as we've done on previous SRF loan projects. So with the effective loan rate on the, the uh, $9 million would be 1% paid back. Schedule uh, 2019, the application went in. We are currently at the bond ordinance and agreement stage. Design has begun and will bid and construction to follow late in 20 into 2021. 
Non-point source dollars, if you haven't seen what these are, uh, these are dollars that we work with uh, the conservation districts and East Dakota Water Development District and other groups up in the watershed to secure buffers along Skunk Creek, its tributaries in the Big Sioux River to improve that water quality. It's a really great program that we've been doing for years. This loan amount will secure an additional $457,000 of funding to go towards those efforts. Uh, previous success that the Storm Drainage Fund recently had with SRF loan usage was the 43rd and Terry area improvements. A couple years ago, we went into that area, had multiple street, inlet, and pipe improvements, and the significant portion of that project was 12-foot diameter, one-mile long underground storage uh, facility that provided 5 million gallons of storage under Marion Park, and then the picture on the right is basically that same park today. Uh, you can't tell the system's even there. It's a wonderful uh, asset to our storm drainage system and also fit well into an existing part of town. With that, I'll open it up to any questions. Then we would look forward to coming back for a second reading uh, next Tuesday. Thanks, Andy. Anyone from the public who would like to speak to this item? Councilors, you got questions for Andy on this? Councilor uh, Starr. Uh, Mr. Berg, will you take us back and show us what of that 457,000, the 1%, what would those projects be? You showed us examples, but do we tell the state what those are going to be in advance, or is that something we work towards as we you know, make those payments? Sure. There, there's a, a group that in, includes us. Uh, it's called the Big Sioux Watershed Group. Uh, it consists of those groups I had named earlier. That group puts together a project implementation plan that is approved by the state that lists a variety of things such as these SRAM buffers and uh, different measures that include animal waste feeding operation planning. So it is not, these dollars are not specific, specific to any one of those. They just go into that pool and those dollars continue to be spent. And there's a, a five year, um, sunset on each of these loans as we get them. So that continued funding is really uh, beneficial to that group. So these dollars will have five years to be spent and the ones we've secured previously are in that window right now. Okay, so as we repay, because I'm a simple guy I'm trying to figure this out, but if I, that one, the 457,000, when does that money exist as part of the repayment? And then as the repayment schedule goes, we take that rebate them back from the state or can we invest it at the beginning sure. and we borrow it as part of the bonding? The, the state will allow all the dollars to go into that, that fund immediately. However, there is a true up at the end of the loan. If we spend less than the nine million or draw, uh, there'll be a true up and those dollars will be reduced accordingly. Perfect, thank you. Yep. Councilor Steely. Andy, are they still doing that big Sioux River Summit? Yes. Where is that going to be held this year? Uh, we have not set the location this year. Last year it was in, I believe, December, and we held it at the downtown uh, Hilton. Because you used to do tours of different areas with, I suppose, with COVID, that puts a hindrance on it. Yes, we, we have not... Uh, we have not begun the planning yet because of a lot of the uncertainty right now, but um, we, we look to do that every year annually. Uh, we've done it in the fall, and then we've moved it to December as of lately due to some scheduling issues. But, yeah, the intention is to have it each year. Um, and, and then is Lance still with the city? No, Lance took a, a job out in Philadelphia, actually. Okay. Yeah, I didn't realize that. Thank you. All right. Anyone? Any other questions for Andy? All right, does anyone want to make a motion to set a second reading for Tuesday, July 14 on this? So moved. Second. Okay. Nicer. Motion by Kylie, seconded by Nicer. Discussion on the council? All right, hearing none, let's take a vote on this. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Nicer. Yes. All right, that passes 8-0. Item 69, please. Item 69, first reading. An ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, authorizing the mayor to enter into a ground lease agreement between the United States Postal Service. Recommendation is to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, July 14, 2020. Good evening, Matt. Good evening. Matt Nelson, Public Parking Facilities Manager. Um, 
So to start with, just to explain why you're seeing this lease, typically you don't see parking leases come forward to the council. Uh, because the term of this lease is over a year, we do have to get council approval on it. Typically all of our leases are considered month to month, uh, and there's a 30 day cancellation policy for us as a city or for the individual or business that carries that lease. So this lease is with the United States Postal Service. It is for our uh, D2 lot, which is located adjacent to the post office building. They uh, desire to lease the entire parking lot. Um, it is a 10-year lease with a 10-year option, so it's a total of 20 years, but those second 10 years would take city council for approval, so there's an action required to move that forward. Uh, the city continues all the maintenance on the facility, which would be snow removal, lighting maintenance, sidewalks, sweeping, striping, asphalt repair, uh, and anything like that. Uh, and then there is a termination clause in there for the USPS. Uh, it is a 60-day termination clause in their favor. Uh, we are comfortable with that because typically we would ask 30 days of our uh, uh, tenants, so they do have a 60-day term to lock in this 10-year uh, agreement. Uh, and the biggest reason that we need to lock this in is more uh, for their funding side of it. So they have a difficulty funding month-to-month -month leases and they do desire to have a longer term lease. The term of that lease, it, it increases 10% every five years and those terms are laid out on the right side of the screen. Um, and then the location of this lot, as you can see, it's uh, shown on the map there. Uh, it's pretty unique. There's probably a couple buildings that would typically lease from that location, uh, but it is located adjacent to the post office. So with that, I will answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Matt. Anyone from the public here to speak on this item? Councilors, you got any questions from Matt on this one? Move approval. Second, second. All right, motion by Selberg, second by Sale. That's to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, July 14. Any discussion, councilors? Seeing none, let's take a vote on it, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. Next item, please. Item 70. First reading, an ordinance approving the annual rate increase pursuant to the franchise agreement for ground ambulance service for the City of Sioux Falls with Paramedics Logistics, South Dakota, LLC. Good evening. Oh. Recommendation is to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, July 14, 2020. Good evening, Alicia Calora, Health Department. I am here for first reading for the ordinance which authorizes the annual ambulance service rate increase. The agreement between the City of Sioux Falls and Patient Care EMS requires contract compliance in numerous areas, including response time performance, clinical performance, system improvements, workforce stability, pricing compliance, and reporting compliance. The City's agreement with Patient Care EMS also stipulates that ambulance service will be provided without subsidy and that the primary means of compensation will be through fee-for-service reimbursement of patient chargers. Each year, those charges are either are adjusted by either 3% or the increase in the consumer pricing index for any given year, whichever is greater. All rates and charges for services shall be approved by REMSA and the City Council. So for this past year, ending in May, the consumer pricing index urban was 0.1%. Uh, I misspoke earlier and I said negative 0.1, it's actually 0.1. Therefore, the patient care EMS rate increase for your consideration of approval is 3%. Councilor Neitzer, earlier you asked what the medical CPI was, and I did bring that information. It's actually 5.9% is the medical CPI for the past year. You have received the REMSA annual, annual performance report at Council Informational this afternoon, and Mike Bureau also provided a detailed overview of the performance of patient care EMS. Ambulance service oversight and quality assurance validates that patient care EMS has met all contract compliance requirements. The REMS board has approved the request for the 3% rate increase, and I'm here for any questions, as well as Mike Bureau from patient care EMS. Okay, thank you. Anybody from the public have any comment on this tonight? All right, if not, counselors, any questions? I'd move to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, July 14th, 2020. Okay. Second. All right, we have a motion by Star, seconded by Sale. Any other comments? We'll call for a vote, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Okay, that passes eight to zero. All right, next item. 
Item 71, an ordinance, first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, authorizing the mayor to, to enter into a lease agreement between the City of Sioux Falls and the Sioux Empire Triage Center. Recommendation is to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, July 14, 2020. Hi, Alicia. Okay, Alicia Clara, Assistant Director of Public Health, once again. I am here to present first reading of the ordinance um, authorizing the mayor to enter into a lease agreement between the City of Sioux Falls and the Sioux Empire Triage Center nonprofit. We talked about this lease agreement in greater detail on uh, June 16th informational. This is the agreement that I did ask you to pull so that I could reschedule it for tonight. Uh, we had a few conversations about the insurance and everything was cleared up. This lease agreement is between the city and the Sioux Falls uh, Sioux Empire Triage Center nonprofit and it is for the annex building at 132 North Dakota Avenue in total. The lease includes um, all of the square footage and has an estimated annual valuation of $173,000. This amount will be applied in kind toward the city's financial contribution of the triage center or link. The term of the lease is from the time it is executed through the end of 2023. As with other city agreements, this lease has many provisions protecting city interests, including the tenant being responsible for improvements, security, tobacco control, and all of the appropriate insurance and indemnifications. The lease agreement before you has been approved by the Sioux Empire Triage Center partners and is um, ready for your consideration. All right, thanks, Alicia. Anyone from the public who would like to speak to this item? Councilors, do you have questions for Alicia on this? Move approval. Second, Kylie. All right, motion by Silberg, seconded by Kylie. Set a day of second reading for Tuesday, July 14. Any discussion, Council? Seeing none, let's vote on it, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. Next item. Item 72, a resolution vacating lot H2 and tract 1 in government lots 1 and 2 in the northwest quarter of section 19 township 101 north range 48 west of the 5th primary in Minnehaha County, South Dakota, a portion of lot H2 in the abandoned railroad right away lying within government lots 1 and 2 in the northwest quarter of section 19 government lots township 101 north range 48 west of the 5th primary in Minnehaha County, South Dakota. A portion of lot H4 in the abandoned railroad right away lying in government lot one in the northwest corridor of section 19, township 101, north range 48 west of the 5th prime meridian, Minnehaha County, South Dakota. A portion of lot H5 in the abandoned railroad right away lying in government lot one in the northwest corridor of section 19, township 101, north range 48 west of the 5th prime meridian, Minnehaha County, South Dakota, bounded by East Arrowhead Parkway and East 10th Street, as shown on Exhibit A. Good evening, Kurt. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, item 72 is a right-of-way vacation near the Willow's Edge Edition on the east side of Sioux Falls, uh, just east of Veterans Parkway and Arrowhead Parkway intersection. Property owner submitted the right-of-way vacation pursuant to South Dakota law and complies with the street vacation policy. Uh, vacation limits are being coordinated with the city's Arrowhead Parkway project, a future project out there that will um, add some needed capacity. Neighborhood meeting was not required. There's no access road there now. Um, item 72 and 73 kind of go hand in hand. Uh, engineering does not have any concerns with the proposed vacation. All right, thanks, Kurt. Anyone from the public here to speak on this tonight? Councilor, you got any questions for Kurt on this one? Are you here to speak on it, sir? Yeah, come on forward, you bet. All right. You're off the hook. Councilors, you got any questions for Kurt on this one? Seeing none, uh, can we get a motion to approve it? Move approval. Second. Okay, motion by Selberg, seconded by Kylie. Any discussion? Let's take a vote on it, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero, item 73. Item 73, a resolution vacating a portion of the East 10th Street public right away as shown on exhibit A. Hey, Kurt. Hi, um, again, this one is in the, in the vicinity of the uh, number 72 disproved. Just to the north, it is 10th Street Gravel Road, um, proposed to be vacated a portion of that to aid in the development of the area. Engineering does not have any concerns. 
All right. Is anyone from the public who would like to speak to this item? All right, counselors, you got any questions for Kurt on this? Councilor Starr. Thank you, and, and Mr. Mayor, it's more of a statement. If those of us on the council haven't lately, drive out there. There's some dirt moving. This is going to be an incredible project for our city. The number of lots that are going to be available, the, the amount of growth for this part of town is, yep, I think Kurt just put up uh, uh, the, the map for the number of lots, and this is going to change this side of town. It's, it's a, a pretty amazing project when you consider the amount of work that's being done and the investment that's being made in our community. So just wanted to point that out so it didn't get missed. Great. Any other questions or questions at all for Kurt? All right, I'd look for a motion to approve this one. So moved. Second, Sale. Motion by Kylie, seconded by Sale to approve this item. Any discussion on the council? All right, let's take a vote on it, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Okay, that passes eight to zero. Item 74. Item 74, a resolution vacating the West 17th Street public right-of-way bounded by the West right-of-way line of South Grange Avenue to the East right-of-way line of South Covell Avenue as shown on the attached exhibit. Uh, item 74 is um, being withdrawn. Sanford has contacted planning and engineering in the last week and due to everything that's going on, they are going to uh, delay their project and wish to withdraw this at this time. All right. Thanks, Kurt. Anyone would like to speak on this item? Council, you got any questions for Kurt on it? I'd move to withdraw item 74. All right. Second, sale. All right. Motion by star, seconded by sale on that. Any discussion? All right. Let's vote on that motion to withdraw. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. That passes 8 to 0. Item 75? Item 75, a resolution vacating the South Euclid public right-of-way between the north right-of-way line of West 17th Street to the north lot lines of lots 19 and 38, picture addition to the city of Sioux Falls, Minnehaha, South Dakota, as shown on Exhibit A. Uh, same thing for this item. Uh, Sanford wishes to withdraw at this time. All right. Thanks, Kurt. Anyone want to speak on this tonight from the public? Councilors, any questions? I'd move to withdraw item 75. Second, sale. Okay, motion by star, second by sale to withdraw. Any discussion? Let's vote on that, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Staley? Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero. Item 76. Item 76, a resolution vacating the South Scarlet Oak Trail public right of way between the South Right of Way line of South Sugar Maple Drive to the South Lot line of Lot 18 in Block 22 of Arbor's Edge, in addition to the City of Sioux Falls, Minnehaha County, South Dakota, as shown on Exhibit A. Uh, item 76 is a right of way vacation out in Arbor's Edge, addition in East Sioux Falls, just um, north of Willow Run Golf Course. Norman Engineering, on behalf of the owner, submitted the right-of-way vacation pursuant to South Dakota law, complies with the city vacation policy. A neighborhood meeting was not required as there's no road there today. Uh, they're looking at developing the area um, similar to what's shown there with a, a private road. Uh, the vacation is just to the, the top and the north end of that uh, exhibit that's shown there. Uh, vacating this little piece will aid in the development of the private road and cul-de-sac. Uh, engineering does not have any concerns with the proposed vacation. And I know there is one gentleman that just talked to briefly, uh, had some questions about um, pedestrian access. He lives in the Arbor's Edge neighborhood to the north and had some questions about pedestrian access to the park, which would be south and east of here and then also um, secondary ask access for emergency services. Uh, Shannon Austin and I spoke with him briefly. I'm, I'm not sure if he wants to speak any further, but uh, I, I believe we've answered his questions and um, engineering supports vacation. All right, thank you, Kurt. Uh, is there anyone who would like to speak to this tonight? All right, then counselors, do you have any questions for Kurt on this item? Move approval. All right, motion to approve by Councilor Selberg, seconded by Councilor Kiley. Any discussion, Council? All right, let's vote on it, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? 
Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero. Next item. Item 77, a resolution of the City of Sioux Falls approving the preliminary plan of Copper Crossing Edition 12114-2020. Welcome back, young man. Good to be back here. <laughs> uh, the applicant here is um, Perry Kolb, the owner of Empire Homes. Uh, it's located south of East 26th Street and east of South Veterans Parkway. Uh, it's roughly 5.85 uh, acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this preliminary plan is the applicant is looking at subdividing uh, those acres for seven uh, lots for future townhomes. Thanks, Jason. Anyone from the public who would like to speak to this item? All right, counselors, you got any questions for Jason on this one? Okay, look for a motion. Move to approve. Second, sale. Motion by Kylie, second by sale to approve this. Any discussion amongst the council? All right, seeing none, let's take a vote, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. Item 78. Item 78, Annexation Legal Description Correction 12035-2020, Tract 1D of Macrossan Edition. Uh, this is the annexation correction for the uh, Foundation Park area that I referenced earlier with their rezoning. Uh, they needed to add the southeast quarter into their annexation uh, legal description. Uh, once this is approved, then we can get it over to the county and get it annexed into the city. So, All right. Thanks, Jason. Anyone from the public who would like to speak on this topic? Councilors, you got any questions for Kurt on this one? Move approval. Second. Motion by Selberg, second by Kylie to approve this item. Discussion, Councilors? All right. Hearing none, let's take a vote, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. Item 79. Item 79, a resolution authorizing the mayor to enter into an agreement entitled Local Government COVID Recovery Fund Reimbursement Agreement with the State of South Dakota for the receipt of CARES Act funds to address the COVID-19 public health crisis. Good evening, Sean. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, the resolution before you authorizes the mayor to execute an agreement between the uh, state of South Dakota and the city of Sioux Falls relates to the CARES Act funding that the uh, state of South Dakota received from the federal government. Um, and they are passing through a portion up. Our eligible amount is up to $41 million for the city of Sioux Falls. Uh, for eligible, it's one-time funding for eligible COVID-19 related expenses uh, from the period of March 1st through December 30th of 2020. Uh, we covered up the details. We covered the details of this uh, grant agreement uh, in the grant presentation uh, as part of our financials a couple weeks ago. So I'm happy to entertain any questions that you have in regard to that. This is the first step that we would take uh, in order to access these funds. All right, thank you, Sean. Anyone from the public who would like to speak to this item tonight? All right, counselors, do you have any questions for Sean on this item? Councilor Sar. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sean, um, as the dollars come in, the, the 41 million roughly that we're looking at, do we apply for each or portions of that as we go, or is it all one request that we make at one time? Um, so we're allowed to make multiple requests. My understanding is they would make payments up to twice per month once we submit the documentation, and that documentation is reviewed uh, independently from the state and then eventually authorized by the state for reimbursement. So like the million dollars for the uh, rental assistance, housing assistance, we could apply for that once this resolution goes into effect or if a million Correct. is enough to? Yeah, so the first step is, is passing this resolution. It's a template primarily a template resolution that was given to us by the state that all counties and cities in the state are required to pass. So that's our first step. There's an online portal for us to submit uh, the documentation uh, for them to review and then authorize a, approval. So we haven't gone through that process yet, but we fair, uh, assume it would be fairly smooth. Um, but it will take quite a bit of time to, to accumulate most of the documentation required. For the items, I get that. Um, 
where do those funds go then once they come to the city? So the state writes us a check or transfers or however they give us our money. Where does that go into a line item or how, what, where are we tracking that? And then how are those funds then used? Would they just go to the general fund or the reserve? Um, at this time, so they would just come in as grant contributions and they would be deposited with the general fund or recorded with the general fund. Okay, so there's a line item of where they're accumulating before. Just general grant contributions, yep. And then that would cut, it would require the council to take action to allocate those to a department or to a, a program? Correct. Perfect. Thank you. Other questions for Sean tonight on this? Councilor Kiley? Just a quick question. You had stated that it's going to take a considerable amount of time to uh, put together all the documentation. Are, is that billable time as well? Um, you know, for some grants it is, such as FEMA, we're able to allocate some of the time that we have for staffing to, to accumulate that data. We don't think this would be as onerous as, as submitting to FEMA um, because there's a pretty lengthy review and requirements that's uh, associated with that type of programming. Um, but we don't expect to receive reimbursement for accessing the funds. Thank you. Councilor Stark. I'll wait her. One other question. Do do we have kind of a penciled in number of where we're at or what expenses that we've already accumulated? Like I know it, I was going to say it was easy, but I would never say that about your job is anything but easy, but we could take what we're going to get reimbursed for police and fire and for a number of things that we've done, the million dollars for the, the housing. So how close are we to the 41 million at this point if you're sitting down just guesstimating through the process? Um, it's a little bit challenging to answer that. I mean, even in the last week, the state issued on Friday additional guidance in regard to that. That kind of opened up additional eligible costs that we might be reimbursed for. Um, so we are continuing to accumulate that information. Uh, we're also challenged by the fact that we're two weeks away from releasing the city budget, so a lot of our staff time has been devoted to that task. Um, and once that's accomplished, then we'll be working more fully on, on gathering that information. But we are working presently to gather that, but there's a lot of pieces to it. You can't be reimbursed for, say, police salaries that were funded by grants, um, so we have to wade through some of that documentation, but we expect there we'll be able to access a significant amount. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, other questions for Sean on this? Look for a motion. Move to approve. All right. Second. Uh, motion by Kylie, seconded by Starr on this item. Uh, any other discussion amongst the council? All right, let's take a vote on it, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Sale. Yes. Haley? Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Knight, sir? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. Next item. Item 80, a resolution approving the vacation of a 251-foot section of South Stokes Avenue and all of East Stokes Circle in Split Rock Township, Minnehaha, South Dakota. Good evening, Mayor and Council, Kerpeppel Engineering. Uh, this right away is uh, on the east side of Sioux Falls, just south and west of Six Mile Road and Arrowhead Parkway intersection. Uh, it is not within the city limits, but it is within the city's extraterritorial area. Split Rock Township Vacation Resolution 20 03 was approved on May 12th, 2020. Uh, South Dakota law requires the municipality to act on the vacation as well, and engineering does not have any concerns with vacating. All right, thank you, Kurt. Anyone from the public to speak on this one tonight? Council, questions for Kurt on it? All right, seeing none, is there a motion? Move to approve. Sale. Second, Kylie. All right, motion by sale, seconded by Kylie to approve this. Discussion amongst the council. All right, seeing none, let's take a vote, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. Next item. Item 81, a resolution vacating a portion of the 66-foot 60, wide section line right away in a budding 10-foot utility easement within said properties as shown on Exhibit A. Recommendation is to set a date of hearing for Tuesday, August 11th, 2020. Uh, item 81 is out in that Arbor's Edge uh, area again in south, um, in East Sioux Falls, just south of Arbor's Edge and uh, east of the Willow Run Golf Course. 
Uh, Norman Engineering, on behalf of the property owner, submitted the right-of-way vacation pursuant to South Dakota law and complies with the vacation policy. Uh, the vacation request has been coordinated with the City Parks Department and South Dakota Game Fish and Parks due to its proximity to the Big Sioux River. No concerns there. Uh, no road exists in the section line right-of-way um, and vacating the right-of-way and releasing the easement line, uh, abutting it will aid in the development of the area. This uh, Vacation goes uh, along with the Scarlet mm -hmm. Oak Trail one uh, approved earlier. Uh, this one, just the timing didn't uh, quite work out to have them together. They needed that Scarlet Oak Trail piece uh, vacated earlier. Engineering does not have any concerns with vacating this section line right away. All right, thanks, Kurt. Anyone from the public who would like to speak on this? Council, do you have questions for Kurt on it? Move approval. Second, so all right. Motion by Selberg, second by Sam. Let's just set a date of hearing for Tuesday, August 11 on this. Uh, any discussion, Council? Let's take a vote. Council Member Selberg, yes. Sale, yes. Star, yes. Staley, yes. Brecky, yes. Erickson, yes. Kylie, yes. Neitzer, yes. All right, that passes eight to zero. We got one piece of new business uh, added after the agenda deadline, item 82. Item 82, a resolution advising and giving consent to the appointment of members to certain citizen boards, that being Robin Burnley to the Civil Service Board. All right, anyone from the public here to speak on this? Can I get a motion to approve this one, Council? Move to approve. Second. All right, motion by Kylie, seconded by Sale on that. Let's take a vote to approve Robin. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero. Councilor Steele, you want to make a motion to adjourn your last meeting? Move to adjourn. <laughs> Second, star. All right, motion by Staley, seconded by star to adjourn. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed? Yes. All right, we are adjourned. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>